Good evening and welcome to the Board of Selectmen's meeting for Monday, March 10th at 7.15. We did open earlier today with uh, the Budget and Revenue Task Force, which uh, we met across the hall with the, uh, the school committee and other financial officials and our state delegation. I want to thank everybody for coming to that. I want to remind everyone that this meeting is cable cast and it's also recorded by ACMI and other people here. So this meeting is being recorded and may be replayed later. Uh, I do, I want to open with um, thinking about some people that we lost in the last couple weeks. It has been a tough couple weeks for some of the, uh, I was described as the lions of activism and volunteerism in Arlington. Uh, Harry McCabe, Bill Armstrong, and John Fitzmaurice have all passed within the last couple weeks and they have all been uh, stalwarts of for the town in supporting and volunteering and helping this make the community that, that we lo know and love. And so I'd like us all to take a moment of silence in, the, in their memory. Thank you all very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I may, uh, each of these, each of us could go on for quite a while, I'm sure. But I, I would just like to say a couple things about Harry McCabe, former member of the Board of Selectmen, former town moderator, in 1989, a young upstart by the name of Greeley decided to run against Harry for selectman, and I squeaked by in that election. But he came to my headquarters that night to congratulate me and wish me the best of luck. I mean, I think that's a, that's a kind of class. He's got to be one of the longest serving uh, town meeting members. But uh, anyhow, just God rest their souls. Thank oh. you, sir. Thank you. <coughs> At least you beat him. When I ran against him in, our, in, section, in uh, Precinct 21, he beat me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I lied about him the whole time. Too. I didn't want to bring that up here, but I smeared him the whole time. Oh, oh, Kevin. <laughs> uh, I am going to briefly take, so we have a number of items on our agenda, and one of the last items on the agenda was, uh, is the Community Preservation Act. But we do have our state delegation here with us, and they <laughs> did ask to weigh in, and so I'd like to invite uh, both Senator Donnelly and uh, Representative Garbley to come on up and, t and and kind of give us a preview of the hearing that we're going to have uh, later tonight. Thank you, Jim and Dunn, members of the uh, board. Uh, thank you for taking us out of order. And I'm here to uh, testify and support the Community Preservation Act. I know that uh, over the last couple of years it's had strong support in the legislature. Last year I know we increased uh, $25 million in that uh, surplus account for it. And uh, I believe that we made a statement, both the House and the Senate, that we're go going to commit to doing that on an ongoing basis, or at least to support this very, very important goal. Um, I think it was 2012, we added uh, fields uh, to uh, renovate the fields. So, you know, you have the opportunity to open space, affordable housing, historic buildings. Um, there's just so many things you can do with that, uh, you know, Community Preservation Act money. Um, having represented Lexington, seen how it can really work and how it's worked throughout the state. So you have strong support in the Senate, and uh, I'm let Sean speak for the House, but, uh, and I think that uh, the communities, more and more communities are taking this, and it's a form of local aid, and, and I just don't see us reversing our support for this bill. So I strongly urge that this committee uh, support the Community Preservation Act, and, and let's make sure that we have a positive vote. Thank you. Thank you for Thank joining you, us Senator. tonight. Thank you, Chairman Dunn. Just to our to agree to the sentiments of Senator Donnelly and speak in strong support for the Community Preservation Act. This has been an issue that has been de debated at length uh, in the House of Representatives as in the Senate as Senator Donnelly has spoke. And the outcome of that debate has really been a fruitful conversation in looking at some of the three, many of the 351 cities and communities across the Commonwealth that have adopted CPA and seeing the results uh, that have come from that in each individual representative's communities. They come back to the House and they really are able to show us what kind of an impact the state dollars have had in their community. And it's, it had, it's been an incredible impact. And as the Senator stated, it, it is a strong uh, commitment to many of the aspects of communities that, that we love day-to-day uh, -day life uh, for all of our residents. And it's a strong sense of local aid from the state. Uh, many members of the House and the Senate have spoken in strong support, uh, as the delegation here tonight has, uh, to, to our speaker, to our Senate president. This is a strong commitment 
that the legislature is not going to back away from, and we view it as a strong commitment to local aid, and we hope the board will take that local aid. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you both for joining us tonight. Thank you. <coughs> okay. Next up, we have the consent agenda. Minutes of the meetings for February 24th, request for contractor drain layer license for Hydrotech, request for one day all alcohol license for Gibbs School on March 29th, request for one day all alcohol license for Mar also March 29th at Arlington Catholic High. Is there anyone here for either of those events who wishes to speak? Move approval. Um, Mrs. Mahan. Um, just with the correction under the minutes for Article 20 that the vote is four to one. I've been, I communicated with the chairman and Mrs. Kropelka. So, yeah, just to, so with that adjustment to the minutes on page four of uh, February 24th. Move uh, approval, yeah. We have a motion, we'll do we have a second? Amendment, yep, second. Do we have a second? Second. Anyone from, any, from either of those schools who want to talk? Seeing none, any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Five zero. Next up, appointments, Trust Fund Commission, Damon Barglow. Mr. Barglow, come on, come on up to the microphone. Thank you very much for agreeing to serve in this position. Uh, could you share with us, uh, we've got your resume, could you share with us just a little bit about what motivates you to be excited about the Trust Commission and what you think the job will do for it? Uh, yes, sir. Thanks, first of all, for the appointment. I'm very appreciative of it. I've uh, been a resident of Arlington for about 14 years, I'm raising my kids here. I've done uh, quite a bit of volunteer work. Uh, most recently, for the last six years, I've served uh, for a, a board for a security analyst in Boston. And really, uh, I'm finishing that up and was looking for a way uh, to serve my local community. And, you know, I, I love Arlington and it seemed very appropriate. I, for the last uh, 14 years, I've served. Um, or uh, rather my corporations have served as corporate trustees for, for many m municipalities. Mm -hmm. And I was also interested in actually being uh, uh, one uh, on the other side as a trustee. Uh, and um, uh, just something that I thought would be uh, a way to give back to the community. Kevin? Uh, just thank you very much. Uh, okay. It's your kind of volunteer that's the lifeblood of this town and to bring this kind of expertise. Thank you very much. Move approval. Second. Thank you. Any further conversation questions? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Five zero. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks, Thanks so much. Yep. Next up, uh, traffic rules orders of, for approval. John F. McCackern Memorial. Uh, we have a, a few weeks ago we referred the question of memorial to the public memorials committee and they have come back with a positive recommendation for this memorial. Does so anyone want to, Joe? Yeah, I, I just wanted to note that I, I know that um, since we um, did move to refer this, there have been further conversations between uh, the Friends of Waldo Park and um, uh, Mr. McKecker, uh, Mr. Riley, as well as the Public Memorials Committee, so that uh, everybody is kind of on the same page. Because as you know, a lot of work was just recently done at Waldo Park. So um, I know that they're all working together to try to make sure that whatever is put in place here is both <coughs> consistent with the wishes of the bequest, but also consistent with the, um, the, the, the desires of the neighborhood down, down there as well. I just want to make sure that was, that was uh, put out there. Okay. And I'll move, I'll move approval. We have a motion. Second. Steve. Um, I just want to thank the Public Memorials Committee. This was a really quick turnaround on this. And, um, well, I, you know, it's the amount of money that's being given from Mr. McEachern's Guild of the Town is pretty astounding. So I, um, I think it's fitting that the Public Memorials Committee uh, did such a great job funneling this through. We have a motion. We have a second. Any further discussion? And all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? 5-0. Thank you. Next up, uh, presentation on the Arlington Cultural Commission. Adria Arch. Or, yeah, no, or. <laughs> Welcome. Hi, correction, standing yes. in for Adria Arch. Actually, Adria Arch shouldn't have been on there oh. since um, she is, um, well, I'm, I and Barbara. Well, I and Barbara and Roly are here, and Barbara and I are co-chairs. 
although Adria is, of course, a very active member of our commission who does a lot of great work, and we're very appreciative of Adria, but she was never intending to come. She couldn't make it this evening. It's by all, it was so anyway. <laughs> So, um, well, you know, I, I don't, I think you've had this report ahead of time, mm -hmm. so I don't know how much detail you really want. Should I just go through the items on it? Yeah, I would say that you definitely don't need it to read it to us, <laughs> because, but thank you, but yeah, if you want to hit the high points, the things that you're most excited about, in particular things that you think that we should be telling other people about, or things that you need our help in uh, making happen better or more. Okay, well, you know, I mean, since we're a brand new committee and People weren't really quite sure what we were about, and I think when we first um, got started, um, we, we had to figure out what we were about. So the first thing was to sit down and do a mission statement. I will read the mission statement because I would like everybody to know what the mission of the Arlington Cultural Commission, soon to be renamed, will be. Um, it is the, mis the mission of the Arlington Cultural Commission is to serve as a vocal and visible advocate for arts and culture in Arlington and to advise the Board of Selectmen regarding all matters of a cultural or artistic nature in town. So um, then one of the first things that we were charged with um, is uh, dealing with um, the bus depot mural and what happened there and some of the miscommunications or lack of communications that, ha that happened or did not happen between with the artist and the community and the people who participated in doing that mural um, were apparently um, informed but, not, but the reports weren't clear and not unconformed and unfortunately um, there was no chance to memorialize the mural or document it or anything before it was um, removed, cut through uh, with the new right, uh, right spot store that went in there. So um, we got the parties together and convened a meeting to try to come up with some recommendations of how to avoid this in the future and how to make the lines of communication perfectly clear. So what we came up with was a public policy um, document guidelines, some recommendations. These guidelines are recommendations. Of, first of all, a process for public art, which helps, helps the artists and the, the public or private property owners think through what are the terms of this artwork, how should it be maintained, who is responsible for maintaining it, what are the materials, what are the safety issues, how long, most importantly, how long is it going to be up? Is it temporary, is it permanent, and how are we going to let you know that it's reached the end of its line? I mean, the right spot had every right to move into that place. It was a private, kind of private building, really, owned by the MBTA, so things happen. Private buildings have you know, different interests, and even, even public buildings, things happen to them, and so, so lots of public art is not permanent. So the question is, um, how do we communicate that to all par parties? Which so I have uh, here some you know, public art, art um, guidelines, and it also comes with a, an agreement. And the reason this agreement is here is just so that the own, uh, property owners and the artists have, there's a document that says they each saw this, they each had this conversation about all of these terms, and, here the pe and, and to put their contact numbers down. Also community partners, if there are schools involved, who made the mural, everybody, Contact information is here and informed of if anything needs to happen to the mural, if the mural needs to be taken down. And it's not just murals, sculptures, whatever it is, and it has some criteria for removal as well. And this document, I just want you to know, is derived from the American uh, Friends of the, is that right? American Friends of the Arts? Yeah. American Friends for the Arts. Americans for the Arts, right, I knew I was getting it wrong. Americans for the Arts. So it's a standardized document which I've distilled into its smallest possible form. <laughs> Okay, so, um, but anyway, it's, you know, it's research and standardized in locations that have good, robust public art programs. So, we are recommending that the Board of Selectmen adopt these guidelines and use the agreement when um, commissioning art on, on public property or if any artists want to be done on public property. We're also recommending through publicity that artists use this with pi private property owners as well. It will go on file in town with our arts and culture liaison, which is the next um, item on here that we recommend that um, the town have an arts and culture liaison, which is housed in the town. To start with, this would be a, um, an unpaid intern for 10 hours a week to inventory public art, to establish this kind of file. Ultimately, we'd like to see this position grow, be funded, so that we can have a regular, you know, check-in on each 
pub piece of public art, the status, the files updated. So, so that you know, if something's up for five, 10 years and people pull out this file and of course it's totally out of date, everybody's moved and you can't reach anybody, or, or there was some maintenance issue that wasn't dealt with years ago and that's why the part, uh, pieces and disappear, you know, just to, to keep up with the, the maintenance and what's in town, but also to do a number of other things, you know, help write grants for the town, for um, arts, and arts and culture programs, uh, coordinate publicity, assist production, promotion of collaborative events, um, and so forth. Um, so that, uh, that's where the position would go as it, as it would grow. Um, and we'd like, uh, we'd like permission to advertise for that permission, the unpaid intern, for now through, and for it to come through the human resources department. So um, we have a job description which is attached here, although we think we might need to pull it back a little bit for the unpaid intern. Do you want us to stop and talk about that one a little bit? Pardon? Do you want us to stop and talk about that position a little bit, or do you want to keep going? Um, oh, I'm happy to stop and yeah. talk about that. Did anyone have a particular, my thought was um, th that we would might consider sending that one to the town manager to take a look at is because, uh, frankly, the Board of Selectmen can't manage a, a part-time employee. We wouldn't, we would be terrible at it. Um, <laughs> and so, well, <laughs> I was thinking of applying, Mr. Chair. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, is it okay if we refer to that particular question to you to see what, if there's a... Okay. So I, I agree, uh, uh, sorry, Stephen, were you Go next? Go for sorry. it. Oh, it's just, so I, are you, uh, Stephanie? So Stephanie. I, so are you thinking we would actually make the appointment of this liaison or? No, no. I think, you know, <laughs> I think. That was pretty emphatic, Stephanie. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely Unless not. you want yeah. to. <laughs> Unless you want to. No, but no, I mean, no, we're, no. we're happy to take that no, on, you know. No, just no. for clarity. So. Yes. No. no. So you, so it, we'll, Adam will come back and explain yeah. how it would take. Yeah. Thank you. Steve? Um, do you, is there uh, currently someone volunteering in this role right now? That no, you, no, we are you kind, guys of are kind of the of volu you know, collaborative volunteers, but it's more work than we can handle. Okay, thank you. Anything else, uh, Diane? I actually have a question comment on the um, addendum A for the public art guidelines. So, um, first off, just because you're going to clarify tonight, I think, under Article 15, any confusion between um, the different cultural commissions and committees. Where it appears in um, your proposed addendum A, Public Art Guidelines, ACC, will that become ACAC if the vote is successful? Yes, and I'm happy to amend that and resubmit it. I just want to make sure we're. I didn't want to overstep. No, 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 but I, yes. just for clarity's sake. And yes. then um, in terms of, and, and I, I've gone through this, I guess I would, through the chair, um, Ask town council, and I know this is just a draft, and you know the first part of the document and how, how we go forward with it. Um, in terms of the bodies outlined, in terms of the um, Arlington Public Art, it, soon to be possibly ACAC Board of Selectmen and/or Parks and Recreation Department. Do you feel that that's a marriage of um, stakeholders that can make that um, decision? Is it something where, no, this has to be a policy? If we do adopt some form of a public art guideline, no, is that something that the policymakers, the Board of Selectmen, have ultimate with input from various departments? Or no, is that something because it's publicly owned land and or school land that the town manager and superintendent, um, who is the governing, approving, enforcing authority? Or do you want to think about that and, and say at a future date? Yeah, I'd like to just sort of take your comments okay. and um, obviously this is a first time, well not the first time you guys probably looked at it before, but you're reviewing this and take those comments and examine those issues and can report back to the board and to the uh, mm -hmm. commission. I, and I, I'm, I stand behind this 150%. I just want to make sure that when we start incorporating and drafting it that whomever or what, whomever, you know, it, it could be the superintendent and the town manager, it could be whatever, with the advice from you know, only to public art, say, so you, when you're looking at it with the legalese sort of eye, if you could define actually who has responsibility, policy makers or um, appointed town or, or school officials. Understood. Joe? Well, for, first of all, I just want to 
Thank you for all of the work. This is, you haven't been in existence for very long, and, and you've produced an awful lot, a lot of work here, and, and this is, you know, as comprehensive a, uh, an annual report, I think, as, as we get from, you know, a lot of our commissions and committees have been around and doing this for quite a while, so thank you, and there's a, there's a lot of good, um, good work that's been done. I, I did have the opportunity to uh, attend the forum that you had um, c convened over at the Senior Center probably five or six months ago, and uh, it was very well attended. Brought together, you know, local business folks and and, uh, and um, representatives of different cultural organizations, and that's exactly what I think we were hoping that we would see. My question was very much what my colleague, Ms. Mahan, had about the, um, the mechanism. Did I understand that, you know, I know that there are some public art projects that are kind of being generated through Arlington Public Art and maybe with, in collaboration with the commission, in those cases where they're strictly a, a private um, endeavor, you're just recommending to artists that they utilize these guidelines to, to protect the mutual interests of themselves and, and exactly, the, the property and that it be you know so that there can also be a record in the town too, so that we can help follow up in case <coughs> there need some changes need to be made. Or, you know. yeah. and, and if it helps town council, kind of in his his analysis of this, was your thought then that when there are initiatives. That are either going to be on, you know, um, property that's under the jurisdiction of the board of selectmen, or conversely under the jurisdiction of the parks and recreation department. That at the time of a approval, if an approval was needed from from our board or from that 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 commission, that we would request that as a condition of approval that that um, participants utilize um, these guidelines and sign on to them. Is that kind of roughly what what you had in mind? If that helps town council when you're looking at this? It is helpful. We've had some preliminary discussions about this mat about the <coughs> guidelines and the um, agreement. Um, there's obviously some uh, different ways in which you could structure the actual mechanism yeah. in reading this. Um, you could either make it more explicit in the agreement or you could s kind of allow the agreement to have some flexibility. Would you prefer to have each one of these things approved before a public art installation could go in, or which is it going to be a process by which you know only a certain uh, you know uh, board is going to decide based on who the property owner is? You could, in theory, just to address Ms. Mahan's question for a moment, you could, in theory, have a process by which the board of selectmen could weigh in on something, even if it's um, you know not ex necessarily exclusively under the board of selectmen's jurisdiction. Um, there's a lot of different ways that you can construct it, and we'll obviously talk about it. Uh, but it is helpful. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Thank you, Kevin. You. Well, I was going to make a motion. We, I was also going to uh, we. Uh, um, I, I was going to. I had cut her off to talk about that particular position. Okay. Did you have what motion? Do you should we let her? You want to finish that? Sorry, finish the, the yeah. report. Those are like, those are sort of the, <coughs> the meaty. Yeah. Uh, parts. So the rest, I'll just you know, rattle off very quickly for the record, and just for anybody who's watching out there, just to know um, the outreach and relationship building part. That's the meeting that Joe referred to on October third, where we convened um, cultural organizations and businesses involved in the, sort of the cultural sphere. Um, and we are planning another one of those meetings, May tenth, and hope to involve the May Chamber of Commerce as well. I'm sorry, May May eighth. Thank you very much, <laughs> May eighth. <laughs> That's a Thursday, right? Thursday, May 8th. Um, another one, and you're all invited to attend that as well. I mean, the town involvement is also crucial, and the business community, arts and cultural artists, you know, <coughs> just to make it more regular. As you know, Arlington Alive was a big initiative that happened, and we just sort of want to keep the momentum of having these conversations and collaborative opportunities um, regularly uh, throughout. Um, so, you know, to build community and to heart. Har start pooling our resources and thinking strategically together. Um, the arts and culture website and calendar, as you, as you know, um, one of the three priorities that came out of that Arlington Alive meeting, which was June 10th, 2012, I won't, go, I won't repeat that, what th that meeting, but th um, three priorities came out of that. One of them was a leadership body, which is the cultural commission. Another one is a, a central communication mechanism or a website where um, arts and culture why we need liaison. No one can manage a website on their own. We have uh, many organizations have kind of started it. We also have a website with a calendar on it, but nobody can really, you know, keep up with that so without having a dedicated person in that position. 
um, keeping town apprised of public art projects, just to, when, it, when there is a public art project, which is in um, between um, a private uh, property owner and, and an artist, we'd, we'd just like to let you know what's happening, even though I guess you don't have any jurisdiction unless you want to have a jurisdiction, but um, just, to, just so you know what's happening in your town. Assist in the establishment of a policy as it pertains to arts and culture. What is that? <laughs> That's oh the yes, I'm laureate. sorry. I'm sorry. The these are these laureate. are yes, yes, yes. The, the wonderful yes. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I got confused. Apology. Yeah. I think a public art. I thought I thought we um I thought I repeated myself, but no. It refers to um, the initiatives that. I used to like you, Stephanie. <laughs> 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 I think it was the way it was worded. I got thrown off. But these refer to the article, the Warren articles that were put forward about the poet laureate and the street performances, <laughs> which we're. Which of course we're very excited about and want to put you know on paper in our report that we would love to work with um, the board of selectmen in any way that might be needed in any way which might be helpful on on those initiatives and any future initiatives like that Can that I don't come directly from us. Dan? I should have done this when you were on number seven, oh. um, keeping the board informed of public art projects. Whatever um, vehicle you all deem appropriate, I know um, I would love any sort of. Um, Maybe it's just a word description, that's fine too, but if we could get any sort of black and white schematic or, or something of what's being proposed, unless you think that's too cumbersome. Um, I, I was trying to think of how you could inform the Board of Selectmen of the mural that's going by um, Anthony's Deli, which I think you said had something to do with Marathon and, yeah. and a Greek uh, revival. I don't know if, if you don't have to, but um, in the future, if you want to just, you define how you inform the Board of Selectmen a, be a bonus for me, a benefit would be, if possible, if there is, I'm not a asking visual, anyone yeah. to commission anything, but yeah. you know, if there's just something that's sort of just a quick little sketch, or maybe it's just words. Like that you does have exist. Here. So, I, how would you like to receive that? Just if you just could send it to the board, to Mrs. Kropelka, and um, you know, I'm not asking you. To, it doesn't have to be color or anything like that. Yeah. Just whatever you have. Um, it just would be nice to see the visual if you have it. Yeah, I have it. That'd sure. be good. Thank that's you part of that. that's part of what this procedure does is it asks for a design mm -hmm. quite far uh, you know in the beginning up front in the process that's one of the steps that right. needs to be taken so yes we do have that thank you okay. yeah can I keep going Sorry, she was on did time. you have anything oh the on? last thing is just yep. the name change which we're about to adjust anyway so yep. I can table that well yeah we'll get to that when we get to the public hearing so let's okay. do that all right questions <coughs> comments motions I'd like to move receipt second uh, included under receipt is uh, asking the town manager to look at the hire, asking the town council to continue to work with the council on the uh, agreement. Telepathy is a wonderful thing. Isn't it? <laughs> uh, did we have anything else in particular we wanted to attach to that? Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? 5-0. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephanie. I kind of wanted to bring up the name change now, but because it's a hearing, I'm going to keep it at the end. Sorry. Next up, Arlington High School. It says my name, but I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> Dr. Bodie. <laughs> uh, I will say just a brief introduction. That uh, So Dr. Bodie and uh, uh, her traveling tour of architect and school committee members are uh, doing, you did, uh, this is one of three public hearings you're doing? One of three. Your, uh, last week we did a presentation to the school committee. Tonight, for all of you, and by the way, thank you very much for inviting us this evening. We really appreciate this opportunity. And we will be presenting this also Wednesday evening, weather permitting, um, to uh, parents in the community as well, as, well as, uh, as community members, and hopefully we'll have some town meeting members attend as well. Um, let me introduce, be, introduce to you Lori Coles, um, who is the architect of this report and who is an architect. In fact, um, some of you may know Lori from her work as being the architect of the Thompson Elementary School, which we all, it's an opportunity here to tell Lori again how much we appreciate such a beautiful building that is, was delivered on time and under budget. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lori. Um, as you know, we've been talking about for quite some time the, uh, many of the building issues at the high school and thinking about w when, are we, when are we going to renovate the school and, and is this something that needs to be done sooner rather than later. And last year, we, to begin this process, the school department um, hired the engineering firm Onsite Insight 
to look at all the mechanical, electrical, and infrastructure needs of the school. And that report you've seen, um, and those that, that are watching this evening, all of the reports that, that I'm mentioning are on the district website under Arlington High School facility documents. In that report, there were an outlining of all of the, um, all of the physical issues of the building. And what was particularly alarming in the report is that when you look at a tw at 20 years um, rollout of, of doing these kinds of repairs, virtually every repair needed to be done in the first year. Coupled with that, uh, we went through a 10-year accreditation process last year uh, through NEASC, which is the New England As um, Association uh, Accreditation Association for Schools and Colleges, and they have put the high school on warning for facilities, while at the same time lauding all of the good work that's going on in the school. The high school has not been renovated since the late, late 1970s, and we've done repairs, and I think that we've done a good job trying to fix the, the deficits that they've come along, and, and, and that's a credit to the town. But the, the school has gotten to the point where it really does need major renovation. So we're here tonight to give you more information about the needs of the school so that you can you would be willing to join with the school committee in voting to present a, a statement of interest to the Massachusetts School Building Authority, um, which will be due no later than April 11th. Our goal would be to submit this, uh, this request probably late, late March. And delivered to all of you last week was a, a draft copy of the statement of interest as well as these reports. So we're trying to stick to a time limit here, and um, I'm going to turn this over to Lori um, and let her talk about the uh, programmatic issues at the high school. Thank you. Thank you for having us here tonight. Um, earlier, we tested shutting off part partial lights in this room, which helps with the light. So I don't know if that's okay with you. Go folks. for it. helps with the slides. Um, so uh, this is what we're trying to outline here today, uh, overview of the school. The bulk of what I'm going to talk about is the programmatic space needs, a little bit about safety and security, a very little bit about facility condition because, uh, as Kathy mentioned, there's another report on that, and similarly about enrollment projections, which uh, Diane is not with us tonight, but sort of speak for themselves. Um, so everyone is familiar, everyone's been to the high school. Um, basically, we're looking at three different generations of a building, the oldest being uh, Fusco, which is to the left on your screen. The bottom of your screen is Mass Ave. Fusco is from the 1914, so it is on its 100th year as we speak. And the complex here is the Column House in the 1930s, and the back part um, is Downs in the 1960s. Um, and then various little bits here and there. And as Kathy said, real renovation work didn't happen until um, 70s. So this diagram, you don't need to be able to read every little thing, but what we try to do is establish um, what else is happening in the building. So it's a very large building. It's almost 400,000 square feet, which is one of the largest high schools in the Commonwealth. Um, but it has a lot of other uses, uh, including the school administration, the preschool program, town offices, um, and the lab collaborative program. And so they all take up parts in, of the building. Um, and with that, we sort of established, in conjunction with circulation, which I'll go into in a moment, the high school itself only probably has a net program square feet of a little over 200,000 in this large building. These are rough numbers, but that's, that's what we've come up with. Um, so in looking at sort of the programmatic space needs, these are the different categories. I won't read them. I'm going to try to do this presentation half the time I did it last week. So if I feel like I'm cutting out things, let me know. So um, the high school space use, and so this is where all the academic, um, the shared use spaces, the administrative support spaces, what may be a little hard to see, but if you look, um, there's a lot of little asterisks and little dots on various rooms, and I'll get to that in a moment. We call them sort of the obstructed view rooms, if you think back to the old garden. Um, so this is, this is very telling. The, uh, everything in blue is circulation. So we did um, 
a rough calculation, and there's more than 5,700 linear feet of corridors in the building. There are 20 sets of stairs in the building. It's a big building. To say it's confusing is sort of an understatement. Uh, I certainly cross paths with people who have been there a lot more than I have, and they still need directions. And I'm an architect, and I was walking around with floor plans, and I still was getting confused as to where we were. Um, so, you know, what, what, and this adds to sort of the bulk of the building is all this circulation, and the circulation's for good reason. You had to build on to the next addition and so on and, and make connections. But what happens on a given school day, if you're a student and you're on the fifth floor of Fusco and you're World, world language class and you've got math next, you're all but running mm -hmm. to get to math, which is in the far end of downs. And so you're going down one building and across another and back up. And a lot of times what they're doing is actually cutting through the library, which doesn't make for a very good library space, but they're trying to get to their class. So um, a little bit um, touching base on a few photographs of, of classrooms. Uh, so this is a typical general classroom. And I will point out what I did was look at, um, in comparison to the MSBA, the state funding mechanisms, they have guidelines for educational spaces. And only 23% of Arlington High School's general classrooms meet the minimum size square foot classroom requirements that MSBA has. It's pretty low. Um, and then another example of a classroom with what we call the obstructed view. And what you see happen in something like this, oopsie, is that the, you know, you have all kinds of floor space you're not really using because you've got to cram the kids to one side or cram the kids to the other side so they can see. And even when they're doing that, the teacher says, you know, you spend part of the day doing that to try to see what's going on. Uh, <coughs> similarly, this happens to be a science classroom. Um, Similarly, science classrooms at MSBA, per their guidelines, are 1,440 square feet. The average classroom in, for science at the high school are 1,000 square feet. And I'll layer on top of that, MSBA guidelines assumes 23 students in that room. We have 28 to 30, typically, in the room. So again, <laughs> plus obstructed view, um, you're really uh, causing a very tight um, situation, which has an impact on how they are able to uh, do experiments and so on. So there's a lot of specifics um, I won't get in too much into, but. Um, <coughs> and then this is just an interesting shot. This is a, literally a triangular shaped classroom, which the teacher does an excellent job in teaching in, but again, not ideal. Um, the next category is technology and other necessary features. So it's kind of a, a, a lump of, of a lot of different components that uh, a, you know, 21st century school building would like to see. And what you're looking at here is pretty outdated science equipment. And uh, this I was telling this story and people couldn't really get the picture the last time. This is a very creatively jerry-rigged um, overhead um, a ceiling projector. And so ceiling projectors are what are commonly used now. You don't use TVs, you don't you want a ceiling projector. And because of either obstructed view, the waffle construction, et cetera, no, not enough power and data, a lot of classrooms don't have this. This teacher happened to figure out, figure out a way. He's got the core draping over and down and wherever it goes. And he b built a little plywood platform for it and he got it up there on the ceiling. So he was, he was pretty happy with himself, but it's pretty tricky. This one sort of speaks for itself, um, basically, uh, a lot of uh, power needs, data needs, and wireless. Unfortunately, again, with the construction of the school, it's not easy to um, accommodate wireless technology. Um, basically, you almost have to have a wireless technology node in every room, <laughs> which just defeats the purpose. And I think the last one here um, was the best example I could have, just a picture of um, an AC unit um, sort of tidied up for winter, because I'm, I'm sure it's very cold. But again, uh, you know, a modern refurbished um, school building would have air conditioning in the library, in the computer labs, in the administration, and in nowadays in a lot of schools in the general classrooms as well because they're used throughout the calendar year. Um, so adjacency in size, this is a little more trickier to get your, get your hand around, but you know, there's more than one size t-shirt.
place. And they, and they offer different opportunities depending on the size. And so you have your general typical classroom where you have 20 plus kids there. But you might want to be able to send four or five kids to what's called a small group room or a breakout space so they can do a project. I mean, this is very common and what we'd be looking for. So this happens to be one of the typical classrooms. Um, I, it, maybe it's hard to tell, but it's very undersized. Um, this happens to be an example of a breakout space. Yes, they are in the stairwell. This is where they go. So a teacher would say to kids, okay, you can't all be doing a project in this one room. It's too small. You five go that way, you five go that way, and come back in 20 minutes. Um, I'm sure the kids don't mind, but there are better solutions. Um, I did not want to get into looking at bathrooms, so we just have a picture of, an out, uh, of the doorway to one of the toilet rooms. There's not enough toilet rooms. They're not located in ideal spaces. They're few and far between to get to. And where they're located are actually um, not in ideal spaces because they're at the very end of the corridor, sometimes into stairwells. So they're hard to supervise and they're hard to monitor and kids don't really want to use them. Um, so there's a lot of issues around, you know, placement of things in the building. Um, this happens to be a, a, a photo of one of the family and consumer science spaces. But this is an example of, this is a program, there's a few others in music, where the space is so disparate throughout the building. You know, they're on different floors. Um, it's hard for the teachers to communicate and work together um, and for the, for the um, spaces to function as ideally as you'd like. Space needs, uh, this is a photo of the cafeteria at lunchtime. And um, it speaks for itself as far as being crowded. Um, the other issue with the cafeteria is if you've been there, it has this very <laughs> big central stair, which makes it hard to monitor and keep an eye on everything. Um, the next space, this is a shot of the library. Uh, again, columns, um, sort of not a very uh, welcoming space with all the sort of, uh, both the, the kids cutting through, there's a little, very lot of circulation that happens in the space. Again, just not an ideal and also square footage undersized. We've already talked about the sciences um, as being undersized. And just so you didn't think I made up that other photo with the kids sitting in the stairwells. There's a well. different kid <laughs> doing a different assignment in a different part of the school. But again, um, you know, when you think about space needs, it's not all about the big spaces. Sometimes it's about the small spaces and incorporating the different ways that teachers teach and the different ways that students learn. Um, the next section, um, safety and security. Th this starts to get into, again, thinking about the size of this building and monitoring this building and keep an eye on everything. Um, you know, those lengths of quarters are not all, they don't all have adults right there. Um, and what's being flagged here in most instances are stairwells and bathrooms. Those are usually the, the hot spots. The thing about the stairwells is they're not all regularly used. How could you possibly use 20 flights of stairs all the time? That and coupled with the fact that there's, I've got some good pictures here, there's the bottom of and the top of stairwells that just don't have traffic. So, um, you know, kid can hang out there. Mm -hmm. And uh, similarly, you know, there's a number of corridors that really don't have a lot of program spaces off them. Again, because of the old you know, additions, getting from one space to the next. There's a lot of circulation that happens. Um, one thing overall about the security in the buildings, there's 50 exterior doors, and they are not tied to a security alarm system. Five of them, Five, Five of them. Yeah. So they all can be shut and locked, but should somebody stick a rock in them, they can be kept unlocked, and, you know, people can return at off hours. This is, this is the best picture I could come up with to come up with. Um, let's say, an antiquated public address system. <laughs> no telephones in the classroom. These two things alone are security issues because you need to be able to communicate. You need to be able to, adults need to be able to know what's going on in other parts of the building and communicate with each other well. And if anyone's ever been there when the bells ring, it's the most jarring thing. Again, it's just antiquated um, and, and it's very loud. Um, the, the science spaces, not to harp on them, but they are also their own version of a, um, a safety issue. And really, the teacher has to make a decision. Can I do this experiment? I mean, they're using chemicals and so on. Is it too crowded in here? And so it's, you know, they make the decision, I'll just do the experiment up front. And they don't get to do the hands-on because this is the size of the class and I can't accommodate that. So, um, you know, it just the, the sort of safety issue of that. And one other safety issue, I have to say, it has to do with those cords, which I know you have here as well. But again, with a room of 25 kids and stuff, <coughs> having cords and wires draping isn't ideal. 
I'm not going to go into this because I may be out of time. Um, but this is just a, a quick bulleted list. And just a word about the um, on-site insight report. Um, the, the main purpose of such reports are for maintenance planning. So they help the facilities folks and the bu budget-minded folks. What do we have to do to maintain this building? It's, it's not a report that responds to major issues. It's not a report that responds to educational needs. Um, it's not something that is going to, I'll give an example, in the report it says, oh, put a couple thousand dollars to investigate the water infiltration. It doesn't solve the water infiltration. And there's a lot of examples like that. It doesn't universally solve all the accessibility needs. And so it's a tool, and it's a very good tool. We come across them. We've worked with them on Site Insight over the years. And they do something that serves its purpose. But what they've offered and done is not the same as what the MSBA state funding agency would support helping you do. It would be something that would be separate and done by the town on its own. The MSBA, as a funding mechanism, wants to ensure that the money they're putting into a project is not only fixing the building, but supporting the educational needs for the foreseeable future. They, that's what they're going to be looking for. Um, uh, just a quick, we sort of looked at some crowded spaces. Um, I'm not going to get too specific, but you can see enrollments are going up. So for a crowded today, it's only going to increase. Um, I'll, I'll paraphrase Diane. I'm not going to pretend to be Diane. but. Uh, these are kids we know about. You know, they exist. You know, so back when you're trying to figure out kindergarten, they don't quite exist yet. They're not born. But once you start getting into the high school ages, these kids exist. So we're able to say, unless they go somewhere else, all of a sudden they're here. And I don't know how I did, but I'm done. So I'm open for you questions. You did fantastic, actually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think you did 18 minutes. So That's you. Good. Yeah. That's good. All right. Do you want to go first? Uh, no, uh, Diane. Um, I don't know if it's premature, but for, first I'd like a motion to support um, and join with our colleagues in the school committee and school administration to submit the statement of interest to the MSBA, I think, Second. by April 11th of this year. Mm -hmm. um, I'll keep my remarks brief because I, I think we, we all have a common voice. I know Mr. Dunn and I, when we've been out on the campaign trail, um, there are some issues of commonality, and this is certainly one of them, um, Arlington High School. One of the things I always talk about, um, first I have a question. And I understand this is just beginning the conversation. So this is not the, the defining mm -hmm. um, document, the defining mm -hmm. plan. Um, is it appropriate where it's mostly a um, sports athletic use, possibly in the future, would it be appropriate to include a possible physical structure field house? Um, the, what we now call the practice football field. Would that comply to be, be included with the request to the MSBA for the high school? And I'm also going to address this question under the Community Preservation Act or no, where it's just purely an athletic or right now in my mind. So, so we're at the, we're like almost in the pre-step first okay. step. Okay. And so what our efforts right now were to support filling out the statement of interest. When you fill out the statement of interest, for the MSBA, it's just identifying your need. It's not, it's not claiming a solution. It's not saying we're going to do X, Y, and Z. It's saying here are all our educational needs. So that's where we're at. And then. So if, athletic if we comes in there. Okay. Athletics come in there and how all, all of that pans out. So, so after the statement of interest, if, let me just give you the next couple steps. After this is submitted, um, at some point, if not this year and hopefully this year, um, Arlington will be put in the queue, as they say, or brought in to start the process, they call it invitation, to be invited to start the process with the MSBA. Mm -hmm. So in that step there, um, you start their whole, they have a very um, detailed process of how to go through both the establishing of what's the needs, that's the feasibility study, what's the possible solution, costs and so on, and then you start the design process and then you start the construction process. So it is a long, mm -hmm. you know, step by step. Um, so we're at the very, okay. very beginning. And, and just, and I know my colleagues will also speak to this, but I always relay my personal experience. I went to Arlington High School, graduated in 1980, and I am literally walking the same halls, the same stairways. As a coach, I also know which stairways aren't really used that much, and you know, there's a different approach that has to be taken to that, as well as um, I hear from 
the student athletes and, and the students with uh, Gilbert and Sullivan over in the Downs building, why are we not using this space appropriately? <coughs> Nothing makes sense. Uh, uh, County, uh, we're in the Middlesex League, and sad to say, and I mean this honestly, I'll give you the list of every high school uh, that we've been to that we've competed in all sports. I've yet to find a high school in worse disrepair than Arlington High School is. Um, so um, I want to applaud my colleagues on the school committee and Dr. Bodie and Ms. Coles and others for starting this conversation, starting this um, process. I, I think it's long overdue, um, and I'm, I'm really excited for at the possibility, and I'll leave my remarks at that. Steve, you next. Uh, thanks. Um, one, uh, <coughs> thank you very much for Thompson, um, and mm -hmm. I completely understand why um, the town is working with you again. Um, and I just have a couple questions. Um, can you talk a little bit about what being put on warning um, means and go into that a little bit further? Or Dr. Yeah. Bodie, thank you. What that means is they've identified um, an, uh, a problem that they give you basically 10 years um, to solve. And during that 10 years, you have to do s reports along the, along the way in terms of what you're doing. What that would mean is if when they come back in 10 years and we have done nothing or very little to, um, to rectify the problem, then the high school could be put on another level or could not even get accreditation. Now, uh, this is, these are all possibilities. I can't speak for NEASC, but it is something that is important. And I think that one of the things that struck them in being in the high school was this, 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 this gulf, this, this big disparity between the education that was going on and the quality of the facilities to support the education. And uh, I think that our teachers have done a great job to overcome a lot of these deficits but at the same time, I think our, stu our children deserve a better building than this. Thank you. Joe? Um, I oh, oh, I apologize. Sorry. sorry, sorry. One, um, one more question. Um, th you know, moving forward would, I don't know if this mm -hmm. might be for Dr. Bode as well, sorry. Um, do you think, do you see, you know, lab, the preschool, the administrative offices being part of your plans? Um, um, I think that again, that's part of working with the MSBA and the feasibility study. Okay. So clearly the town has a need for these spaces. Mm -hmm. So if they're not on this site, where would they be? Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, whether that becomes a little subset to the overall study, uh, it may be that, you know, we were just talking about the preschool and in fact there's a, a component of high school education where they in fact are engaging with the preschool. So, so there's some, you know, purposeful, um, adjacencies happening uh, but it's 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 not up for us to know right now what will be I will tell you but I do know MSBA won't s help pay for town offices I can almost go or, or, or Kathy's office for that matter mm -hmm. so I do know that so so whether that means that there's a way to rearrange things that they're in a location that basically down the road maybe you renovate separate or something that's again but we it's 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 a need, and we have to definitely identify it and be able to solve it when all is said and done. Thank you. Uh, two quick comments. We did look at moving the preschool to the Thompson Project, and as you know, that it wasn't, wasn't feasible, it didn't happen. Um, the lab program, I think it's important for you to understand why the lab program is in the high school. Uh, we are part of a collaborative, and the arrangement of the collaborative was why we were able to reduce the cost of out-of-district special education costs is that each district in the collaborative houses one of the programs, maybe sometimes more than one. We have a lab program at the high school and one at the middle school. In fact, the, so uh, all the other districts do the same thing and, and, is, and that's part of the original agreement. So would the lab program move? It might be very difficult to move it because I'm not sure where else in the district we would because we do have that commitment to do that. Okay, thank you. And, uh, the only other thing is that when we were on our tour, um, not very long ago, you brought up rocks and doors, and in one of the back uh, doors there was a rock being pried open, and people mm -hmm. were coming in and out. So, um, you know, the uh, safety is a huge component of this, and it is uh, very necessary to address. Thank you.
Joe. Thank you very much. Thank you for your work. I hadn't actually intended to ask about the preschool, but you, you actually touched on something. As I recall, MSBA was not, had not been willing to uh, fund the preschool portion. Was that correct? At Thompson. But it sounds like possibly we have a hook where this is part of the high school educational program. Possibly. I, I was just going to say, I don't recall, we never, we never got to the point to ask them whether or not they would fund okay. it. It was, it was something that the, the committee, the uh, building committee decided to pull from the project because we were worried they wouldn't and just financial costs of the project <coughs> to begin with. Right, that, those two issues, well, we never got to the project funding of the preschool, but the, we had a budget, Thompson, yeah. and the preschool took it way over that budget. Right. The second issue was MSBA did talk to us about the site um, square footage, right. that they really did have an issue with, they thought that this was going to take up too great a percentage of the site to yeah. add this in. Yeah. Th thank you, and I hadn't actually intended, but Steve actually uh, reminded me. Uh, thank you for all this material. I spent a lot of time going, going through it. Um, I've always known about the issue with so many entrances and egresses here. My jaw dropped when I saw all of these red dots of unsupervisable areas, though, in, in the high school. I think in this time of heightened awareness of school security, I think that's something we all have to be concerned about. My jaw also dropped when I realized reading it that, that we have three different fire alarm systems there that aren't, don't intercommunicate, so if there is an emergency within the school, the other parts of the school have no way of knowing that automatically, which is really um, a, a big problem. It just, it, it just feeds some of what we all saw when we took the tours, some of the other safety issues in the school, you know, including the, the science rooms and gas shutoffs, not in the room where it, it's, um, this, this has to be um, addressed, so I'm, I'm very happy to be um, uh, supporting it. Um, I did have one question on the process going forward. I, I noticed in the SOI um, that it does say that uh, if based on the SOI review process, a facility rises to the level of need and urgency and is invited into the eligibility period, the district will need to provide a detailed educational plan, not only for the high school, but for the entire district. Well, what does that consist of? Is that essentially something like what you've done in, in this report, blown out to the entire district, or something more extensive, less extensive? <laughs> and how, how does that impact the, the, um, the the schedule and the timeline going forward. Well, the the, edu the educational plan is something that we would be e not easily would take some time to put it all together. But they're looking really to to take a look at our all of our vertical alignments. How does some of the programs in the high school? How do we support them through a vertical process? Um, they, they'd want to they'd want to know for sure. How does the preschool relate to our early childhood program if that was going to become an issue? But they but they. Their, their need for the, is much more at a, um, a, a summary level than it is in a kind of deep analysis. And what, what they would want to know, so for instance, you know, what are the programs that you have at the high school? Do you need them, right? Explain what they are, how they work, all yeah. of that, as Kathy's talking about. If for instance, which is likely, the building currently is constraining the ability for them to do other types of teaching. So they're going to put in and say, well, we, we need these following types of spaces. Again, a written narrative, sort of an educational speak as opposed to architect speak, that says this is why we need this and what we're going to teach and how we're going to teach and so on. So it's sort of a, it supports the need for the physical based on the education. But as I understand it, we have to do that for every facility in the district according to this. So. Yes and no. It would be, for example, more like, let's take science, for example. It's a good example because that's really where our, one of our glaring needs is. You know, we want to be able to, they might want to understand what our educational program is in our, in our K-8. And then what is it that is a, an impediment in the high school for continuing that level of um, depth and rigor and experimentation? for example. And Lori did mention one of the issues is that when you have, say, 26, 28 students in a classroom and you've got six counters to do an experiment, you see high school students around this, you understand that it's so easy to bump into each other that there is a curtailment of the types of experiments that can be done um, because of safety issues. So these are the kinds of things that they're going to want to know, but they also want to know how 
that program that's being curtailed, how that is, is sort of the part of a, a, of a, a more vertical uh, progression in science. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Kevin. Thank you. Um, Dr. Bode, thank you. Look forward to working with you again. Looks like we will be uh, for a while yet to come. Uh, and congratulations to you and your staff and all the teachers for doing such an excellent job in what's clearly a difficult environment for them to do so. So, uh, Lori, thank you for the excellent work of Thompson and an excellent presentation tonight. And <clears throat> if you had a guess, are we looking at a rebuild or a rehab? Oh, I'm not guessing. <laughs> well, <laughs> does MSBA still have that if it's if it the cost of rehab is up to 60% of a new school you'd have to build a new school? I don't know if they have a formula. I think what what will happen is that um, we'll work through in the feasibility study phase all the different possible scenarios. And some of them are just going to get brought up and thrown out, right? So all kinds of scenarios of what could happen. Ultimately, they will look for us to come down to 3. A three, three, nice round number, you know, let's study three, get pricing on three different scenarios, and be able to then say which one's the best one. So now, in generic form, a, lo a lot of times, unless one is thrown out automatically for some reason, three, the three usually are all renovation, renovation addition, all new construction. That's the generic form. So like I said, you may have a condition where one of those is not possible. So, so for instance, at Thompson, you know, just renovation wasn't going to work. So it was hard to just say we're going to just renovate the building. So it, it ended up being, I think, two versions of renovation addition and one of new or whatever the scenario was. So um, you'll go through all of that and, <coughs> and really start to see. And what you're sort of hinting at is it does happen. Again, not to say it's going to happen here. I don't have a crystal ball. But it can happen because renovations or renovation additions can take longer which means more escalation and time frame, sometimes the costs start to be very similar to new. Again, that's all I'm, I'm just saying, not necessarily in this example, but in general, that, that can happen. I think that's what you're sort of hinting at. So, you know, the decision, the decision money always is a heavy player in deciding which is the best approach, but you're also going to be comparing what's the end result. Am I meeting the educational needs? Am I making all the improvements I need to make? You know, those pluses and minuses will be part of that decision. Because say the, say the dollars are very close, and you want to be able to really be sure that you're making the right decision for a lot of other reasons, too. So, uh, <laughs> Kathy, did you want to say anything on that? Or? Yes, there's going to be a lot of variables in this. Um, and I think Lori's talked to it very well. Arlington has a unique, sort of a unique, sort of because we're sort of a, a very, con we don't have much land. One of the things they often look for is can you put a new school somewhere else to make it easy. That's a problem in this town. And it's also the location of this. This is where the high school is. So there's going to be a lot of issues. But one that is going to be how do we do this with all the children in the school because we don't really have a place <coughs> to put them. them. And there will be options. And they, it may come into play in terms of, which option we choose because it could be a renovation addition so that you build a bigger space so you can move more in there, have some in portables, or you have, you, you, there's gonna be a lot of, this is gonna be a very complex mm -hmm. project to do. Mm -hmm. um, Lori was the architect on the renovation of Cambridge Windsor Latin, which mm -hmm. is a comparable size Wonderful. school. Mm -hmm. But not, not anywhere near as complex as this is going to be. I mean, yeah, <coughs> yeah so, so they, they fortunately had a building to be able to put the ninth grade in somewhere else. Because again, it was a similar situation in the fact that heart, heart of the community, you're not going to just up and move it someplace, and there wasn't someplace to up and move it to. So um, really, uh, we worked on the project for over 20 years with various iterations of working on their field house and, no, and so I on. <laughs> no, no, no. It's just that we did the Fieldhouse first and then the War Memorial and, and, and then CRLS. But, but there really wasn't any serious thought that we're just, this is just going to disappear and we're going to start over from scratch. It's different vintage, different ages, um, you know. So it's looking at the specifics of what the interior space is going like, what the, what's the construction of the building, um, and so on. So, um, again, a lot of variables. That's all what happens in this study. So, um, just to be another pain in the neck, I would imagine we're going to have to look at a debt exclusion uh, 
you know, no matter what funding uh, comes through here. Best guess, what year would that be from today? So let's assume we get it in by April 11th, but I know that's way the preliminary start. I'm just ballpark, I understand that it's no easier than the first asked, but. Oh, they have to accept us and they have to go through, it right. depends on how long the feasibility study is. I mean, right. the complexity of this may put it out. I think the earliest it would be is 16. 16, okay. Yeah. okay. That'd be my best guess. Yeah, I'm not, you're not coming. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's, there's variables of, t of time in this that we can't. No, really I understand control. that you can't control, right? Of course. Right. I think once you get started, maybe you start to see the end result, but we've got to get on that path first. Yeah. I, one of the notes I was going to make. Thank that, you. Well, well, yes. Totally to your, to your point was uh, Belmont has put st submitted a statement of interest for their high school 11 years in a row. So there really is a lot of, ex like, you right. just don't know how, how that's going to go. Okay. Okay. Um, I had three other things I wanted to say, but before I did, Paul uh, Schlickman uh, from the school committee, did you have anything th you really wanted to say, or were you just here in support, or do you want to, he's thumbs up, says Paul, thank you. <laughs> um, <Wow. laughs> he, he knows what our agenda looks like, thank you, Paul. <laughs> uh, I get the question, and um, I, I've satisfied it for myself, but at the same time I would like to hear, and I think Dr. Bodie maybe is the right person to answer. Um, is going to the MSBA, I don't want us to feel like th we did it just because that's what we always do. I, going to the MSBA is the right choice because. Can you, t can you walk us through why the MSBA is the right choice as opposed to try to do a smaller renovation on our own or some other solution? Wha well, if you read the on-site insight report, let's say we didn't even deal with any of these programmatic issues. We're looking at in the 30 millions and that's today's dollars. They do have a, 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 a repair program, but that is going to the MSBA in any event. Does Arlington want to fund that? And, and frankly, if you, they may even question whether they should do that because if the building, you know, they're going to ask us, how long are you expecting to use this building if you're going to be putting all this money into it and does it really meet your needs? So um, I think that the, I'm going to let Lori talk a little bit about the cost of this project because I think having the on-site insight report out there may have given people sort of a false idea of what potentially this would cost. And I think we have to be realistic. And, and I think that one of the things we'll, we, we'll be realistic, but I also know that Arlington will do a very good job of making sure we do it the least amount of money that we can possibly do and get a good product. In fact, Thompson is a good example that I don't know of any other elementary school built at that size at that price. So again, many compliments to the firm. But you might want to talk about the expectations on cost. So just to pick up where Kathy left off, I mean, in, in thinking about this, it's sort of, um, you know, to do something small, again, I think it's the distinction of whether MSBA would support you. And then therefore it would be all on the town side and then you'd have to look at what the end result is and if you're satisfied with that. I mean, we're looking at a building that's been here for 100 years. School buildings last a long time. It hasn't been worked on since the 70s, so it's been a long time, and you want to keep this facility up and running for another 50 plus years. So we know that takes funds to do that, and the moment you're at 48% reimbursement with the state, so almost 50%, um, so there's some just general math that, of course, why wouldn't you want to partner with them because it will benefit everything and the end result will be improved because <coughs> of that. Um, you know, again, looking at something that's 400,000 square feet to renovate is a lot of money. And um, you saw in the report, I tried to just outline some different um, comparables, which are hard to compare. Um, but just looking in general with all the numbers of the projects that MSB has done since they've been up and running, which has been about five, six years now. I don't know what was done on those projects. I just know what their costs were uh, per square foot and, and looking at the average. Um, if you just look at that as a comparison, the high schools are running around $100 million easily. And again, that's not necessarily escalated into the future. Those are past projects that are done. Uh, Cambridge Vision Latin was just under $100 million. 
I do know what was done on that project, um, and it was mainly renovation. There was very little programmatic changes in spaces. It was more roof, windows, doors, flooring, finishes, um, but the bones of the building were in good shape and not a lot of restructuring or anything going on. Um, so I said at the last meeting, this is not about shooting the messenger because any point at you, that's really what it is. Um, but <clears throat> I think just from what I just said, I think you already have a sense that you're at least at $100 <laughs> million. Dollars. And so is it 130? Is it more than that? I don't know, because we don't know what the, what the scope will be. But the, but, the, but the main point is, it's not like saying, I'm putting a statement of interest in, and oh my god, it's going to be that much money. We don't know for sure what the dollars will be, and that's the whole point of a feasibility study. So that everybody in the community, all the taxpayers, everybody else is on board with what it is that is being looked at to be done and what those cost implications would be. It's not, it's not that as we talked about, it's not that quick of a process. People will have a long yep. time to digest what the needs are, just like you all were able to, to go on recent tours of the building. The community can go in if they haven't had the opportunity to be in there, if they're not current parents and so on. And so over time, I think people will understand that this is an investment in the future of Arlington. Um, it's an investment in the students of Arlington. And um, okay. yeah. Thank you. Um, my second and third, I guess, uh, are more comments than they are questions. Just to think about uh, for us, I think that uh, do we also have coming investment um, coming up pro in Minuteman Vocational. I know I don't know what, we don't know what form that will take or when it'll take. And one of the things that ta we talked about in long-term planning committee was, you know, how do you make it such that these things arrive at the right time if there is a right time for them? And my personal analysis of there is that there is no way to make there to make it happen and so we should just identify our need and go forward with it and see how the calendars land. And so I just wanted to make that comment that this is not the only uh, high school project that we've got coming up but I don't know of any other way to, to organize or, or order them. Um, my f final thought was just procedural which was that uh, I had in planned on doing a hearing, this hearing today, and then if we wanted, I, I, I had planned on putting this on the agenda for our meeting in two weeks to actually take the vote in case people wanted to do more research or talk to, with other people before they actually took the vote. Mrs. Mahan has made her motion, and if we want to vote on it, we absolutely should, but I just want to put it out there that if we want to leave it, this uh, for a couple weeks, we do, we, we've got, you know, that was actually already built into the calendar. So, I'm done. Mr. Creeley. Well, uh, you know, yes, we're, we're uh, tonight, you know, going to gonna, um, talk about the uh, Preservation Act. We're going to talk about Minuteman. Uh, but what I'm convinced of is we have to do this for the high school. So I'm ready to say, yes, we support you getting it in by April 11th and uh, get that started myself. Any further discussion? Yes, Diane. Just Mr. Greeley and the Chairman's queries. Just it, it can be a yes, no, I'm not trying to uh, belabor it. The first point is where the, um, I call it old hall, where the pit, the Fusco building, since it's on Arlington's local historical register, that, is that something, am I correct, that we would have to, we, we couldn't knock that down. That was something that would need, need to be renovated. Um, I, we haven't looked into it. If it is already on the historic register, then we'd be working with it, the historic commission. Yep. I, it's not on the national historic register. Local. It's on, I checked with the planning department, the local historic register, which gets to my second question, which I won't go into because I'd like to go into detail with my colleagues, and they may raise it under the Community Preservation Act Warren article. Um, taking that premise that, if I am correct, that, that that one particular building, and I think it's the only one, I don't think um, column, in 1937 is on, but I know that is. If that were the case, would it sweeten the pot, um, be a detriment with the MSBA if they saw that when we're asking for their funding um, in consideration of a debt exclusion that we also are, could incorporate, if the voters so choose, just on the historic, local historic Fusco building, Community Preservation Act funds. I'm saying, can you do that marriage with MSBA? Is that something that's been done before? Um, I know Fairhaven did it recently yeah. with part of this. So I just want to get it on the record. Yeah. Um, I would say the answer is yes, but they deduct that from the proportion that they pay back to you. 
Right. So, so it's basically, it's like, you know, it's like getting money from different parts, mm -hmm. and so then your portion still gets your percentage paid back from them. So mm -hmm. they would never discourage a community from finding other sources to help support the cost of a project. Awesome. Absolutely not. That's fair. Thank you. Uh, Joe? I just want to make one more point, just to tie this back around to what we talked about at uh, uh, Budget and Revenue Task Force tonight. I think to your point on, on timing, um, you know, folks in the community should realize that we're about to roll off a lot of the exempt debt service. It's still a number of years out, but um, I think Mr. Foskett referred to it as the inflection point is between FY18 and FY19. We'll, we'll suddenly see a dip in our exempt debt, debt service of over a million dollars per, per year for taxpayers. But I agree, we can't control the timing on this, and we may have to submit this multiple times. It's possible. And um, it, the, the only way that we're, we have a, the, the potential of making the mark, I think, is to, to go forward now. And okay. Thank you. Um, Kathy, yep. I, I really appreciate the motion. In fact, I would love you to, to vote on it. But I didn't realize you were going to vote tonight. So there's actually very specific language Sorry. that must be voted on. But uh, having this motion is fine. It's just what I want to do is bring back to you the specific language at your next meeting that, that has to be um, voted on and signed. Okay. Okay. I, I think I feel like we could if we take this vote today, that vote will be pretty quick. I suspect. Yeah. Um, uh, Mr. Town Manager, just uh, be rash of us uh, to, to jump forward. Are you go, you know, you've heard where we are. Where we're about to go. Do you have any comments for us? Uh, the only comment I was going to make is that this is an interesting issue, uh, and I think um, we need to study this. There's no, there's no guarantee that we start building the pipeline. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Five zero. Thank you, everybody. Is that for a new high school, 11 years? That That's what the town administrator told me, yeah. Jeez. I was, uh, yeah. It he, just looks so much newer than ours. Yeah, I was talking with him, and I was talking about what was on our agenda for Monday. He said, well, let me <coughs> tell you about my. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, do you want to take the? Uh, do you want to take this away right now? Uh, you can. No, we'll oh, oh, you're okay. Okay. Oh. okay. Oh. Noted. Correction. <laughs> 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 it was. Yeah. It was. You heard about Down payment on the new session. school. Nine tenths. <laughs> uh. Thanks. All right. It is eight thirty, and I think we're going to press on, but I suspect we're going to have a break before uh, we actually finish this evening. First up is warrant article hearings. Uh, so next up is warrant article hearings. Our first warrant article is number eight, which is a bylaw amendment for the regulation of outdoor lighting, a dark skies bylaw, which is a registered voter article from Mr. Paul Schlickman. Paul, welcome. Uh, good evening, uh, and thank you, thank you for the uh, vote on the high school. It, it, it's an important thing uh, that we really need to do. Um, and thank you for uh, inviting me here for this, uh, for this article. I submitted to you by email a brief written statement uh, filled with a lot of pictures, uh, basically expressing the need and taking a first attempt at uh, amending our current bylaw. The problem is the current bylaw is such that if you own a house and you put a 100 watt spotlight in your driveway and it shines into your neighbor's window, uh, it, the bylaw covers it. But if your next door neighbor is a utility pole on town land or on uh, any kind of property that's not residential, the bylaw doesn't cover it. So you have a lot of these huge, high intensity, sodium vapor uh, floodlights just scattered around town, spewing light around. And the issue is, on, on a couple levels, problematic. Uh, and became even more noticeable when the town converted the street lights to, to the new street lights because that reduced a lot of glare. I live on the eighth floor at 47 Mystic Street. And 
I, you know, I got a lot more glare coming into my windows from the street lights, uh, which disappeared when you made the new installation. But there's still a lot of glare coming in from these private floodlights, some as far as two blocks away. And looking at some of the other communities that have adopted dark sky ordinances, Acton has a very extensive zoning bylaw, you, you see some points that happen. First of all, if you've got unshielded bright lights that are flooding out, what happens is the net effect is sort of like driving against a car with their bright lights on. And in certain places, these are on our streets, and it makes it much more difficult to see at night rather than easier to see tonight because the light is poorly directed. Uh, and, and this becomes a, a genuine safety issue. Secondly, you get something called light trespass, is that you now have unwanted light shining into your uh, window. And I've got a couple of examples of this in the handout I gave you. The first one is, a, is the pole that is two blocks away from my home that uh, means I don't need a, light, a night light in my bedroom. It, 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 it's that bright that it's uh, glaring into my eighth floor condo two blocks away. And it's right at the end of Russell Terrace by Winslow Street. And I have a couple of pictures of it by day and a picture of it by night. And if you're coming down Winslow Street, you are faced with that glare in your eyes. But even more significantly is the next picture. If you look at the house on the corner, that house is bathed in the light from this, uh, from this floodlight. And people shouldn't have to live in a house with that amount of light being shined upon it from an unwelcome source. The next page gives you a shot of the uh, floodlights that I can see from my bedroom window. The one up here in the middle is that same floodlight. The second floodlight's in the parking lot of the DYS building at 30 Mystic Street, and the third one is a floodlight that is above the front doorway of that building. And, and that has a, an additional problem to it which is its impact on traffic coming down Chestnut Street because it's directly in your eyes as you're driving uh, westbound on Chestnut Street approaching Mystic. Now, it doesn't have to be like this. And just as the new town street lighting has eliminated a lot of the glare, a prime example of being a good neighbor is Armstrong Ambulance, which is like a half a block from my home. And if you look at this view of the parking lot, it is very well lit. You can see everything in the lot. But if you look at it, the next picture, which is this photo, you can see that there's no glare from the street lights on Mystic Street, and there's really no notice beyond their property of that bright lighting that's illuminating their lot. So it's very easy to go and just change the light fixture to go from this floodlight, which is pointed up high into the eyes of people, to have a dark skies compliant lighting fixture that is directed at what you want to illuminate. So that you're doing a couple of things. Is that you're shielding the light so it doesn't trespass and you're making sure that they don't go more than a 90 degree angle so they're not up like this shining in people's eyes. And that's the intent is to go and, and get rid of these floodlights which are a detriment to the town that make it harder to see at night, which cause light pollution, and <clears throat> do nothing to enhance our safety or visibility. It makes the town uglier. So we've taken a lot of effort to change our street lights in town. And we've done every street light in town. And there's no reason why some of these are municipally owned, some of these are privately owned. These floodlights that are tacked up uh, mostly on town-owned utility poles shouldn't be uh, made to comply with, with a dark sky ordinance. If a homeowner is required to comply with a dark sky ordinance, why shouldn't a business owner or the town or whoever else is tacking up these big sodium vapor orange prison lighting on our utility poles, why shouldn't they comply too? And that's, that's the intent, is to 
bring the current uh, bylaw to protect property owners who have lights coming in from outside sources outside a residential area. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Kevin? So, Paul, does this include, like, I forget, motion lights? So we at my house, for example, when I drive in my driveway, there's lights that come mm -hmm. on. Is that considered a floodlight? Well, this has no bearing on that because whatever you have on your house is currently covered by the bylaw. Right. So that God, if... I hope so, but yeah. <laughs> and, and the right now, it only gets triggered if somebody makes a complaint. Right. So, so that if your next door neighbor, if, if, if your floodlight is shining on your next door neighbor's bedroom, yeah. he could call up the building inspector and they could come take a look and see if it complies. Right. But other than that, they're going to leave you alone. Uh, but you're already covered. It's the large right. lot owners uh, who, who are not covered under and the existing bylaw. how is this bylaw. enforced? What, what's your vision for that? Uh, I see, you know, this is up to, to you to, to weigh in. My vision of doing this is to just amend the current bylaw to include these floodlights and light being generated from places other than residential lots. So that if you have a, a town hall or a a uh, privately owned parking lot, or you're using one of these big floodlights to, uh, for decorative illumination of your building, you'd have to go and convert to something that would comply so the light would be shielded and only be on your property. Okay, thank you, Paul. Mm -hmm. Any, anyone else jumping up for this one? Or Steve? Uh, yeah. yeah, I, um, thanks, Paul. Mm -hmm. um, I have, yeah. Um, a couple of concerns. One is that we got an email from Kristen Klein, um, who is with the um, Friends of Robin's Farm, mm -hmm. and he was a little bit uh, worried about uh, their groups, uh, their group not being included because they are um, not sponsored by the town, and I, we're, we don't approve them. So I would like to find language that would appease them. And uh, what, what's their concern? Um, that their events um, are not. Um, spawn like they're not officially sponsored by the town and they're not approved by us so their mm -hmm. permitting is on the jurisdiction of the parks and rec and uh, so that I believe I saw was not included in your bylaw yeah, uh, on number four it says lighting during special events such as fairs concerts or celebrations sponsored so, by the town so the parks and rec would fall under that yeah, uh, okay. yeah and if you wanted to make that explicit you could do that okay um, and the other question I have is, have you had any conversations with the police department? No, I haven't. No. The, you know, I, mm -hmm. I understand the glare mm -hmm. um, argument, and what I'm trying to weigh that against is the argument of, you know, light is necessary. Um, you know, there, mm -hmm. I, the, um, you know, so I was looking at, say, the example that you showed of the one that shine, the light that shines right into your window. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking that, you know, maybe the light, light in the, those areas are necessary. Mm -hmm. I understand the argument of, you know, what type of light and how much. Um, so uh, a follow-up question to that is, do you know what the cost would be to change these lights over to be that become you know, legal under your bylaw? Well, let, let, me, let me talk about light as necessary. If you take a look at this, the, the big photo of the lot that is being lit with two high intensity spotlights, you can see that there's some very bright areas and some very dark areas. Mm -hmm. The lighting is very inconsistent in there, and if you're facing one of the uh, lighting fixtures, it's making it harder to see, whereas it, if you go into the Armstrong lot, which is uh, compliant, the lighting is much uh, brighter and better when you're on the lot. It's just that it doesn't move off. So uh, I, I haven't priced it out, but uh, in, in some instances, these lights are leased from NSTAR. In some instances, you know, they're, they're relatively cheap lights to begin with, 100 to $200 for some of these pole-mounted lights. Um, some of these can be remedied by ins in, in installing shielding or directing them. Others, you'd have to put in a new fixture, which is probably another couple of hundred dollars. These fixtures aren't, by nature, prohibitively expensive. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Joe? Um, th this is one that I'm kind of struggling with. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm sympathetic to the need. I, I know that we, we've actually already 
you know, up in my neighborhood, we've run into some issues with this um, from the Sims project. It's it's fairly brightly lit, and, and uh, there was some um, light pollution to a, a budding neighbors. But those issues were able to be worked out just by working through the um, the, the redeveloper, and, and we have the benefit, obviously, of the designated town rep up there, and with some shielding, I think that the problems were addressed. But one other thing that makes that project, mm -hmm. that project and that example different from what I think you're proposing here is that there are real um, objective measures along that. Mm -hmm. Because it's a project that was under environmental design review and, and special permits, a lighting plan was, was um, <clears throat> submitted, and this was all done under zoning. Mm -hmm. It's all done under zoning. So a lighting plan was submitted and had you know, it's, um, objective measures for how you determine mm -hmm. this. Uh, and so what's making me feel a little bit uncomfortable on this is um, we're being asked to enforce uh, a standard around where something creates glare. Are we setting up a situation where two different people are saying, yes, it's, it's glaring, and some are saying, well, no, it's, it's not so glaring to me. Is there, are we really looking at looking at the situation here where now it's subjective opinion and two people pointing pointing like this. And I know that there have been some situations like that even with the existing the existing um, law. I don't, I, I, my understanding is the existing law actually hasn't, isn't accessed that often, mm -hmm. but it can be uh, difficult when there is, there are some of these gray areas, um, no pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I, I was just wondering how you address that with, um, the, you know, I, I feel like the creating glare that, that may be a um, uh, set up a, a bit of a difficult enforcement situation. I, I mean, the, 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 the intent is not to set up a difficult enforcement situation. And in fact, some of the way that I've added some of the language is defining shielded and uh, is taken from the Acton bylaw, which is pr pretty much the state of the art bylaw for, for light pollution. That sits in their zoning ordinance. But that's a, an extensive 10-page zoning ordinance which details setbacks and a lot of things that are more detailed and more restrictive than what I'm trying to do here. Right. Uh, because we have an existing bylaw, but a, a bylaw that really doesn't address the major sources of glare and light pollution in town, uh, what I try to do is, is gently as possible uh, amend that law to uh, bring it into compliance so that uh, uh, large lights on commercial, industrial, in other words, non-residential or on public ways would uh, be treated the same way as the lights we have now. Uh, previous town council and I uh, worked on the language of the warrant article specifically for the purpose. If the town in its wisdom decided it wanted to abandon this bylaw, and move the whole thing over to zoning. Uh, it could be done the way the warrant article was written, but I think that that's probably a more complicated process than would be needed to address the issue of all the floodlights that are uh, in, uh, glaring and, and doing uh, light trespass in town. Um, I had uh, just a couple, so I'm, I like the what you're trying to do, mm -hmm. and um, the thing that for me on this one is the devils and the details, mm -hmm. and I'm trying to figure out if we can get the right details mm -hmm. to, to make it happy, uh, or to make, excuse me, to make me happy, I apologize. Mm -hmm. um, my first thought is that I would, if I would prefer that whatever language we draft, if we, if we choose to go forward with it, not include 1030 as a specific time, mm -hmm. and uh, the reason is just because I think of Someday, we're going to have first lights of Arlington mm -hmm. or something like that, and we're going to want to be up mm -hmm. past midnight. Mm -hmm. And so I have a, I want to, whatever we do, if we talk about times, mm -hmm. I want us to talk about special occasion or some exception or remove the times entirely. Mm -hmm. uh, I wonder if there's a way to improve this by permitting light to shine on the street in a way that doesn't impede uh, you're like you're shining into someone's li eyes while they're driving up the road mm -hmm. is a bad idea. Mm -hmm. Shining light onto a sidewalk is uh, to improve the lighting on that sidewalk is not necessarily, in fact, often is a good thing. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, the way that this is, the current language is drafted, it actually discourages that. And I wonder if we could... Uh, yeah, the, oh. essentially the idea is if the lighting fixture is here, you want the 
uh, the light to go down. Uh, yeah. And so that if, if that's your design of your lighting fixture and it's placed appropriately, it will come down to the sidewalk and it will not be facing in this direction causing issues. Lighting in this direction helps nobody. I understand that that's your yeah. intent and I agree with it. Mm -hmm. The thing is if we say shall prevent direct light from shining upon any street, we've direct light coming like this is prohibited. I think that's in the current bylaw. I, that we're talking about amending it, aren't okay, we? Okay, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> now, now understand this. I'm, I'm, I'm an educator. Yeah. I am not an attorney. I was not so, trying to, I was no. trying to pass an improvement. I was not criticizing your proposal. And, and I am very open to improvements mm -hmm. because I just took a first draft at this to try to come up with a, with a direction. I, think I, I certainly wholeheartedly support your efforts to improve it and to refer it to town council per, per, exactly. for improvement. Perhaps I should be looking at town council when I say that rather than you because that mm -hmm. definitely was for his benefit more than anyone else's. Uh, my f fourth item, I've, I've lost it, but uh, Diane, and I, and I, I also, I, I'm keeping it going across, but yep. I'm also gonna go, I'll go obvious to the audience. Uh, well, but, should I make a motion or do you want to wait and hear from the audience? Uh, okay. If you're ready. Then. Well, I'll put something on the table. Okay. Um, just quick. Um, I'd like to move approval um, with the caveat of um, the questions raised um, by the chairman um, it, and town council can work through in final votes and comments on that. Um, and if Mr. Schlickman and our other pr mm -hmm. proponents don't agree, they can always file a mm -hmm. substitute mm -hmm. to change it back. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to make sure that I'm understanding this correctly. Um, What's submitted to us is basically um, doing what we do with residential property for com commercial and industrial, in the sense that it's following the same structure that um, if a complaint is made from a residence, the building inspector goes out. So if a complaint is made about the same kind of lighting issue by a commercial or industrial site, the building inspector would go out. Am I interpreting that correctly? That, that was so, not changed in my proposal. Right. Yeah, and I think right. in, in Attorney Himes uh, comments, you also said that, stated that? Well, right now, I don't see something that changes the way that the mm -hmm. basically um, enforcement mechanism would work. So I, mm -hmm. there's, what, what Mr. Schlickman has basically done is stricken some of the provisions of what this covers then added a si relatively significant uh, set of parameters that would also cover it. Um, it still would be a complaint-driven process, mm -hmm. and therefore the building inspector would still be basically investigating complaints um, about a wider array of things, including these commercial properties right. and potentially and, and that was that was my question. Yes, okay. yes. So basically what you're trying to do is you're just trying to take what is employed mm -hmm. over, over under the jurisdiction of the building inspector for residential and just expa expand it for commercial and industrial. So that's yeah, why I want to make as few changes as possible to with the chairman's amendment. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we have a motion. Is there a second? Uh, I'll second. Joe, Steve. Um, you know, maybe I shouldn't be the one to recommend this, but looking at the enforcement, um, you know, you would have to assume most complaints would come at night. Would it make more sense to shift that enforcement to say the police department who has officers on duty every night where they might be able to pick up on this a little quicker and handle it more effectively than say um, the building department which then has to you know kind of backtrack through the next day which isn't always you know a very effective means of enforcement and you know some things can get. Do you mind if I send that question to the town manager? Yeah, of course. Adam? Yeah, well, I, I would actually say given the concerns that have already been raised and also the fact that uh, the proposal would refer or would refer this kind of issue a lot to people mm -hmm. like Edward Woods Corporation or Harvey Bell, um, Harvey Beach has an office in that area. Uh, but for the board, for the final board, that I am not as familiar with the police as a current. So are you looking for us to table this today? Or are you looking for us to take a vote and then, but then perhaps reconsider when we do a final vote on the 24th? Okay. 
Yeah, sounds good. May, may I just add one yep. other piece to it? Um, and it's not ordinarily my sort of place to do it, but while Mr. Byrne is, is raising this issue, um, I think that there bears some consideration also on whether or not the town building inspector should be investigating a complaint levied against the town. So that right now the enforcement mechanism is for the town building inspector to basically go out and examine whether or not there's mm -hmm. light mm -hmm. being shined into residential property. These are only residential property owners. The town building inspector is gonna be tasked with determining whether or not town lighting Wow. is yeah. an issue under this. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily <coughs> at least contemplate for a moment about whether or not um, within the scope of what I think the town manager was suggesting. Okay. Uh, I would invite you both to consider that more close. Personally, it doesn't stress me out, but I'd be, but I think you can go. Just, just yeah. on that point where it says um, add regulations to commercial in industrial property, and it doesn't say municipal, would it apply to us? Uh, I thought that was my understanding. The, the intent is, is to apply for to any light that the resident will have the ability to uh, request the, its uh, So right now you're intending yeah. on inclu inclu including the municipality? Well, yeah, I mean, m many of these lights, even if they're privately paid for, are sitting on utility poles that are on town property. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I, yeah, I'm sorry, I guess what I just want to make clear is that the enforcement mechanism remains the same. So mm -hmm. it's a complaint driven process. Mm -hmm. It's and as such, you'd still have the, 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 the building inspector essentially responding to any given complaint about a commercial or a municipal property. That wasn't clear before. Okay. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone else here who wanted to talk on this particular article? And uh, come on up, Rolly. And I did I just want to, uh, Steve mentioned it already, but we got uh, an email from Christian Klein, and so that would go under this particular. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Rolly Chaffet, and a member of the Robbins Farm uh, organization. We discussed this issue the other night at our meeting. Christian Klein brought it up, and essentially, I think the major concern was the business about the 1030 shutoff. So we absolutely support your suggestion and eliminate that. Now, occasionally, July 4th, for example, we could have a long party, and it might be 11 o'clock, and then we, of course, try to shut down and clean up and so forth. And once in a while, there may be one or two others. But as far as I'm concerned, I, I agree with you. Eliminate the time frame. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wanted to speak on this issue? Okay, so we have a motion from Mrs. Mahan, second by Mr. Kerr. We have comments from a number of members. Further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? 5-0. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Thanks. All right, one moment. <coughs> Excuse me. Article 15, Bylaw Amendment Cultural Commission. And I hope I didn't just throw all my paper on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. Thank you, Stephanie Marlin Curiel. I didn't introduce myself before. Yep. Back before you for this uh, warrant article. So since we last met, <laughs> um, we reconvened to try to come up with a name, and we were advised to retain the name Commission. Uh, it goes, uh, it makes sense to also retain the name Arlington. It also makes sense to retain the name Culture, because uh, you know to be descriptive of what the Commission does and. Being new, we want to be clear about, about who we are and what we do. So we've only been able to change the name slightly, and, um, but the idea is to, to not have the exact same acronym. And we've gone through a number of alternatives, and they still have A's and C's in them. So if the new acronym would be ACAC Arlington Commission on Arts and Culture is the new name. Move approval. Second. Is there anyone else in the audience who wanted to comment on this particular article? Any further? Diane. Is it true, similar to FinCom, you, you want us to call you CultureCom? Yes, we think that would, would help. <laughs> it would add a little zip. To, you know. right. Sorry, sorry. Not like yeah. That is the club, first you know, time <laughs> that talking about FinCom has been associated with having zip. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, thank you. 
as a former member, I can say. All right, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, next up, second water meter. Mr. Tibbetts. Hi. Welcome. I'm Gary Tibbetts, Precinct 5. And I brought this article up to allow the second water meter mainly to encourage water conservation because we're running out of it. Um, one of the things that made me think about it is I live near the Thompson School in the North Union Park and there's the water park down there. It's been there since I was a kid. It's been re redone a couple times. That thing for the last five years or so has run 24 hours a day, seven days a week, constantly. The kids do jam it somehow. Mm -hmm. I've called the wreck about it. Um, and every night when I walk the dog, it's spraying all over the place. Um, it runs when it rains, when it's cold, and everything else. A, a simple rain delay and a timer delay on it would have fixed that. And I started thinking about that, and then I started seeing sprinklers, you know, hose end sprinklers and stuff around town that are on when it's raining, sprinkler systems that are on when it's raining, um, you know, stuff running down the street. It's just a total waste of time, a uh, waste of water. So anyway, what, I, what I'm proposing is to, for Arlington to allow a second meter, which um, would uh, <coughs> promote water conservation, and it would distribute the MWRA charges uh, more equal to all the users of the water. Uh, the the in-ground system the, uh, with automatic timers and rain delays and uh, uh, backflow inspected by the town, they're proven to conserve millions of gallons of water and they protect the water supply. They're also encouraged by the MWRA and the EPA. Uh, they both say that they save a lot of water. Um, the properties in town that would utilize the second meter installed at their cost and permitted by the town for a fee would save water as well as a few bucks on their sewer charge. And a lot of these properties that would take advantage of this are the properties that are, are the bigger ones that are, are getting a disproportionate charge on the MWRA part of their tax bill. It would even that out a little bit. And, you know, lastly, you know, the town is billed by the MWRA for the water that comes in and the sewage that goes out. And it's all metered. So right now, the town is collecting from these people that are using water on their lawns, their plants, their trees and stuff, and they're not paying for it because it's ne never going in the sewer. And somehow that just doesn't seem right to me. So I think that this, you know, allowing this second meter would put Arlington in line with its neighbors. Just about all the other towns around, cities and towns around here, Cambridge, Belmont, Lexington, Waltham, Stoneham, Watertown, Boston, Wellesley, Brookline, all allow this and have for years. Um, so I'd, I'd like to see it happen here. So that's what I have to say. Okay, and so specifically you, you're asking, just so I want to be clear, because I don't, I, I, so you want to be able for a set for like a resident or a commercial to be able to hook up a second meter right. that would essentially and it, it, that meter would then run for things that didn't flow back into the sewage system that's right okay so uh, we've got a memo uh, back from Adam Chaplain and Mike Rademacher do you mind actually could you just point that microphone a little bit down a little bit because I'm getting a bunch of vibe reverb and I think it's thank you um, if we've got a memo from Adam and, and Mike um, talking about our plans for 2015 mm -hmm. that I think is really relevant to this. So I want to hear about that me memo and then uh, take questions from the board. Adam? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I, I think um, Mike and I agree with a lot of this sort of transition uh, to water conservation. I think there's a lot of benefits uh, that residents would be able to uh, see. And, and really that our whole water system would see this. So it gives us all a uh, flood of water conservation system that we're thinking about in the next generation. Uh, the concern we have Could put one in. Uh, so it wouldn't necessarily create 
built for um, built everybody's communities based on their needs as well. So you just look at the December January business. How much money do you have? Okay, you're not even in outside of one another. <coughs> Thank you, Adam. Diane. I'm going to see where this goes. Um, I'd like to make a motion to approve this. Um, I can't tell you how many times over the past 15 years as a member of the Board of Selectmen that I've gotten from residents, including a resident on my own street, um, who have cited, and back then it wasn't as many um, adjacent abutting communities um, to Arlington that had this system employed, and now it's grown and grown. And to me, I would like to move favorable action on this to put this and have the discussion and debate at town meeting, including um, the discussion um, in the proposal by the town manager. And I also don't see where one precludes the other um, in terms of if both ideas were successful. But I think this particular discussion would be useful at town meeting because I have heard it, it so many times over 15 years and never from a, a business or a the, the country club, and I'm not casting any aspersions there, but so many residents, even former town employees, it's amazing how many times when they retire that two out of ten of them say, I now want to ask you this question as a citizen, so I'd like to move favorable action. We have a motion from Mr. Mahan. Is there a second? Uh, I'll second the discussion. For discussion. Further comments, discussion? I, so, oh, sorry, well, Kevin. I, I, um, Gary, uh, uh, just what's your reaction to what the town manager said, if you don't mind? Well, well, Adam, I've met with Adam before about this. We've talked about it. I, I knew what he was going to say ahead of time. And, and part of what he's saying is right. But the way I look at it, that would make the, um, the sewage part of it a little bit fairer to people. But it wouldn't encourage any water conservation. Mm -hmm. if, if anything, it might encourage somebody to just set their sprinkler out and let it run all night. So. It, I, I don't think it saves any water, and that's the main purpose of why I brought this up. I just think as a town, as a country, we're wasting a lot of water. And we're, just before I came up here, I, I was watching a program on the History Channel, and uh, there was a bunch of uh, major economists from throughout the country talking about things. Water is the big issue. You know, we're going to figure out how to deal without oil, and, um, you know, we're going to figure out the food problems, but we need water. And, you know, the southwestern part of the country is the perfect example of where this has gone. We have to conserve it. So, um, you know, you, you, they don't recommend you eat fish out of freshwater lakes in New York more than once a week. It's hazardous to your health because it's such a water shortage. So I think what I'm saying would encourage people to save water, but Adam's saying you could maybe do it in, in conjunction with it. Um, government all the time gives people an incentive mm -hmm. to do certain things. I'm sure the town gave the developers up at Sims some, some financial incentives. I'm sure over on Mill Street they did. This is just an incentive to do the right thing, a tax incentive basically to do the right thing. So, thank you. I, I want to follow up a little bit farther. I want to push just a little bit harder. So I completely agree with conservation, but I don't understand how a second meter would encourage conservation where this didn't. Because that example you just described, if you turn on your sprinkler and you run it, you're going to pay. I mean, you're going to pay for all that water. You're, and not only that, that's going to push you into the higher rate, and then you're going to have to pay at the higher rate. Not if you not if you do it in the off season, in the summer season. So no, if you do it in the off season, if you run your sprinkler in December, January, and February, that's when you're doing it on the cheap. But I mean, you're doing it in the middle of the winter. No, no. I'm no, sorry, I'm no, confused. Then not, what Adam is saying is they're going to measure the sewage in December, January, mm -hmm. and February, and they're going to they're going to charge more for the sewage in December, January, and February. But if you ran your sprinkler in December, it's not going to change anything there. 
the, the, the thing, what you're encouraging with this is for people to install the timers, install the heads that spray it right, install the rain delays that stop it when it's raining. You're encouraging them to do that. And both what I'm suggesting with the second meter and what Adam is suggesting with the tier system could work together to do that and save water. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just not following how, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just not understanding yet. How does the second meter encourage conservation more than a single meter? Well, it's, a, it's given somebody a benefit for going ahead and doing that and installing the rain delays and the zones and time systems that will save water. It's given them a financial incentive to do that. Adam? So you're looking to put the second meter in and all the other towns that do it, you go up to the building department and you get a permit to do it. And the plumber comes and he installs the meter. <coughs> the homeowner or the plumber buys the meter. The town doesn't, installs yeah. it. The building inspector comes down and inspects the meter. The backflow, which protects the water system, mm -hmm. which a lot of people are running these systems without now. And it, um, and he would inspect the rain delay in the, in the, zo in the zones and the timers. So I mean, the town would just be okay. given a financial incentive to do that. And both the MWRA and the EPA both strongly recommend these systems. Okay, I didn't understand that that, was, that, that system was also part of your proposal. Well, I, I included that because people have tried doing this before and it always got beat down because it would be able to be bypassed and stuff. This ensures it's like a sealed system that the building and plumbing inspector inspect and say it's good to go and, mm -hmm. and can't be beat. Got it. Thank you. Uh, I'll defer to the oh, manager. Sorry, and I'll I'll yep, sir. Thank you. Mike. Uh, that's fine. I'll oh, that's what our problem is. <laughs> that's what our problem uh, is. It's so, Mike Rademacher, um, Director of Public Works. I, um, I appreciate the clarification, too, because I was not following how the second meter uh, would. Um, help conservation if you make the water less expensive. Uh, the general rule is that you won't conserve. My con and I agree that if you were to require that you had this uh, irrigation system as part of it, that that would help. My concern would be um, bypass to that. W once it's inspected, the, you can always add another spigot or there's a way around things. And we just don't have the resources to constantly uh, be enforcing to make sure that that second meter is only supplying water to um, an irrigation system. I, I would just be concerned that if those two were tied, we would not always get, potentially not always get full compliance. So. Okay. Thank you. Joe? So am I understanding correctly that th with the second meter, you know, when you talk about the financial incentive, you're hoping that by breaking them up th that, that the individual will actually avoid kicking into the next tier? Uh, Not pricing the next tier. tier, he just won't pay, the only difference would be is the second meter you would not pay the sewage fee on it. Yeah. Which is about half of your water bill, give or take. Right, right. So you wouldn't pay the sewage on, because it's not going into the yeah. sewer, it's not costing the town anything as far as that goes with the MWRA. You know, and, and, and as far as the Sirotomac are bypassing, and I agree, anything is beatable. Yeah. You know, it, it happens. Um, you know, I've been in basements of houses where I've seen the water meters distorted and everything else. It, you know, it happens. Yeah. You know, my dad used to tell a story, I guess, years ago, that ga the gash, he used to put uh, nickels in a, in a thing in the, in the house, and the gas company came and cleaned it out, like, every couple of months. And some guy down on Tremont Street was making nickels out of ice. He was putting them in, of course, they melted. He was getting plenty of gas, but he, there were no nickels in it when the guy <laughs> came and cleaned the thing out. So, I mean, people are going to beat, you know, anything you do, and they're probably beating it now. I mean, you know, there's, uh, I'm sure there's unmeated stuff in town already that, you, you know, so if people are gonna try to steal, it's hard to catch them, no matter but what. But that's why I wanted to clarify that though, because it seems that with the, the, the path we've been on, um, you know, to adjust our rates, adjust our billing cycle, and, um, and to adjust the way that we, we do the, the metering of the sewage, you know, we, with the new tiering system, it seems that, that the, the potential of kicking up into the next higher tier actually is the disincentive to, to using 
more water than, than you need to. That, that's, that's the conservation measure that seems to be implied with what we, the policies that we've already been, you know, set out um, to implement. So. But, but it still doesn't put the stop gaps into play with that's the rain true. delays. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you drive by even some of the town buildings on a rainy day and the sprinkler systems are running like crazy. Yeah. And, but I mean, that, those alone would just, you know, I, and Mike told me that they'll definitely put them in the North Union Park yeah. when this is redone. And I went to the meetings for the design on that and they promised me it would be done too. Yeah. Adam? Uh, Steve and anyone else, and then I'm just a reminder, I am going to go out for anyone else who wants to speak. Just Steve. a clarification yep. um, question for Adam on that. So other towns are the people who install these second meters are benefiting on the backs of the people who don't install them by the higher rates. Um, I have a question for Mr. Tibbetts as well. Um, what, what would it cost start to finish to install what you're proposing here? The second water meter to somebody that has an, uh, an irrigation system, most of the plumbers tell me you're looking at about $1,000 material. And, and then what plumbing. about with the you know, stop? The, the systems, I, I would say, run. And my company does not sell them or install them. This is hmm. <laughs> not, not <me>. good. <laughs> Make that clear. We recommend a couple of companies, all Arlington companies, that do the installations, but we don't. We don't get into it. The average system, I think, runs a couple thousand dollars. You know, soup to nuts with the, the rain delays and everything. And uh, in, just in response to what Adam was saying, obviously we have to pay a certain amount to the MWRA to get rid of what we pump out of here. But right now people are paying for something they're not using. So it's not fair. The town is collecting money from A, B, and C, people that are not using it, and it's lowering the rate for D, E, and F, and it shouldn't be. Everybody should pay for what they get. The town should charge for what the service costs. So I, I agree with you, the sewage fee would, would probably go up. And both what I'm talking about doing and what you're talking about doing could be done simultaneously. The difference between the two is I believe what I'm talking about would save money. As an I said, and as I said, government all the time gives financial incentives to people to do the right thing. And this is the right thing. This is, these rain delays and timers and zone stuff and this new drip irrigation save a lot of water. Okay. And the EPA and the MWRA, I mean, I went online this morning. I was able to pull article after article out about this. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and I'm sure you, some of you people did, too. So. Yeah. If, if, forgive me, Mr. Chibitz. I just want to keep to see if there's anyone else in the audience. Is there anyone else here who wants to speak on the water meter issue? Okay. Not seeing anyone. Is there? Joe? I have a question. Yep. In, in order to allow second water meters, is a warrant article a town meeting action necessarily required or is the board empowered to do that in the course of our um, policy setting and, and rate setting around um, 
so what, what, what Mr. Tibbetts is advocating here is a bylaw that basically mandates a system. Okay. Um, whether or not the board can um, mandate a system of that nature without going to town meeting, um, I'm sorry, I'm just not Not sure. mandate, allow. So to, can the board allow a second water meter to be, I don't know that there's a prohibition of, on installing a second water meter right now. In other words, if somebody wanted to spend the money to install a second water meter, I'm not certain that there's something that would stop them from doing that. Um, but I, I'm, I'm not certain off the top of my head, I'm sorry to say. Yeah, I mean, I, there, there has to be serviced um, by the town, and, the, and, and there's an interplay between the town's um, servicing of the water meter and the station of that. But I'm not sure that uh, on a resolution of the use of private property like that, it can be achieved. I'm just, I'm sorry, I'm not certain off the top of my head. Okay. I'd have to look into the issue a, a little further to see if the selectmen have the authority to promulgate some sort of regulation um, without town meeting. Mm. The, the reason I, oh, sorry, I, I want to keep going with the board and, uh, if we, we'll, yeah, Diane? Um, just to that point, and this is just for um, historical anecdotal information, when this question has come up, and I've raised it as an individual selectman, not that other selectmen haven't done it past and, and current, um, I have always told that the vehicle for this would be to put it before town meeting by previous administrations and previous town councils. That that, because I had said, is this something that we, the policymakers of the town, um, and I'm not saying that that holds true for today, maybe there's different circumstances, but in the past, I've always been told the only way we could go is through town meeting and, mm -hmm. you know, getting it there. And I, just to try to, um, help make my argument as brief and concise as possible, having made the motion um, for uh, positive action to approve. Um, I totally respect the town manager's comments, but just in terms of <coughs> process and protocol, I understand some of the concerns that you have. I was listening very carefully to what you said. You were saying it probably might do this. It could do this. Um, we might have these um, um, unfair charges if the town didn't, in concert with what they're planning on doing, change rates, ad address rates, so that the proper people were paying their share. I, I'm, I feel very confident. I'm like, I don't go by making my decisions on could and might and should. I go by, you know, what's before me and what's the process. And I feel confident that um, if we did, along with what the town manager and DPW uh, director are suggesting, possibly could happen in 2016, not saying it will, um, this is something that could happen with the water conservation uh, driven uh, message at, at the forefront that I feel confident that the town manager and the DPW director would sit down um, and look at the ra rates and make any cost adjustments. And um, I don't think the town manager can commit to us that what he's proposing that might happen in 2016 is actually going to happen. Um, mm -hmm. uh, correct me if I'm wrong. But this is a concrete step that encourages water conservation. I agree. We, we, when you talk about apartments in Arlington, I won't go any further than that. But in terms of if somebody's trying to beat the system, so I'm just trying to make hopefully sway enough votes. But maybe not. Maybe I haven't done that. Kevin, do I see you raise your hand there? I wondered whether Mike could answer the question on can we have currently have a second water meter? Because they'd have to be read. So right now, will they read two water meters? No, we currently the we, the the the, the um, policy is one uh, meter per residence. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just, I'm sorry. I just want to clarify that the, the, the question is: Is there the, to make sure I understand, Mr. Curo? Is there a way in which the board can say we want you to regulate uh, it differently to have a different policy without going to town meeting? I think Ms. Mahan spoke to that, and I. I Frank with the board, I, I'm just not certain off the top of my head if there's a means by which the board could implement that type of regulation on proper prop on private property and, and use of water without going to town meeting because it would affect um, the town charges in a way that's, that's fairly substantial. So I, I have to look into that to give you that answer, Mr. Kerr. Okay, thank you. I think my, my reasoning in that is just because knowing that we serve as the Board of Public Works for the, for the town and we do take this up. My preference is to be able to take this up as, as 
uh, kind of a comprehensive package and if we were to revisit the issue of second water meters to revisit it in the context of the other measures that we're, we're looking to implement. So that, that's why I, I was curious. Um, my com I um, w w will not be supporting Mrs. Mahan's motion. <coughs> I think that uh, the point about fairness is absolutely, is the driving one. And I'm satisfied that the fairness is study will be satisfied by the uh, winter uh, sewer regs that we're going to be doing. It, because I really think that that's going to, what that's going to do is it's going to be making such that um, everyone is paying their appropriate amount for their sewage because they will be um, assuming you know you use your sewer at approximately the same rate the whole year, your sewer rate will be set during the period where you're really only using the sewer and you're not doing irrigation, and then from then on it's about how much water you use, and I think and it, it, not the sewage, but how much water you use, and I really think we can get that with one meter, and I'm really um, content to to stick with that. So that was my two cents. So we didn't have anyone else from the audience. Are there any other further comments from Adam or Mike or the board? We have a motion made by Mrs. Mahan, second by Mr. Kuro. Mm. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. So we have a vote of two to three against. Is there a motion? Oh, I, I move no action. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? <coughs> All those in favor of the motion of no action, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. 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 Three to two. Thank you very much, Mr. Tibbetts. Thank See you at town meeting. <laughs> Um, it is 9.27, and I think we should take a break. Uh, call it seven minutes. We'll be back at 9.34. I know you've been waiting, but if we're going to pay attention to you, we would need to take a little bit.
All set? Thank you very much. Calling us back to order, we are going to resume our hearings with Article 18, Bylaw Amendment Lake Street Signs. This was also a registered <laughs> voter article. <coughs> Leslie Bennett, welcome. Hi, thank you very much. Um, so I'm a resident and I live on Mary Street and I don't know if you're familiar with Lake Street traffic at commuting, particularly even evening rush hour times. But this is a time where Lake Street backs up pretty much all the way to Route 2, those individuals who are trying to get to Mass Ave. Um, it's very difficult, particularly for those residents who live in the neighborhood between Route 2 and sort of up to the Hardy School area. Um, because there are several signs posted on Lake Street at um, Homestead and Little John and Wilson that basically prohibit right turns there, which is perfectly reasonable and nobody wants to take those signs away because frankly a lot of people do turn right and sort of zoom down and try to <coughs> cut up and you know avoid all the traffic. Um, similarly, people turn left into Kelwin Manor and try to zoom up and go around the traffic. Um, what I propose is simply to make an exception for residents who live in that area, just simply to make it okay for residents to turn right. Um, I, in the people who I spoke to and asking people to sign and neighbors in general, m most people support the idea because they, some of them admit to doing both of those activities, turning right where they're not supposed to and turning left into Kelwin Manor and say, you know, it would be nice for us to do <coughs> something about the traffic. Um, some have disagreed with my proposal. Um, one person in particular didn't like it because she was afraid more people would turn on to Mary just because there was an accept residence sign that it would encourage more people to go down that path. I, you know. I don't know, but you know, being a resident and talking to my neighbors thought that this might be one way to try to address a difficult traffic problem, though we know the traffic in Arlington <coughs> is not an easy thing to untangle. I also understand that there might be an alternative to proposing this warrant article. I'm certainly happy to meet with town council or do other, what other is a more appropriate mechanism happy to do that. This was just something that I thought might be, might, might work. Okay. That, that was actually going to be my very first question because, so as the Board of Selectmen, we actually can change signs without going to town meeting we, because, and so um, you didn't have a specific reason that you wanted town, you wanted it to happen, you didn't care whether it was town meeting or the Board of Selectmen. Yes, okay. exactly. I didn't realize that you had the authority to change signs. That's exactly what I propose. Okay. All I am proposing, like there are similar signs in Cambridge, Somerville, Medford, where all you have is <coughs> two words, except residence. That's all it says. It's, it doesn't do anything to the current signage. It's just an add-on basically indicating that, you know, you can't turn right unless you're a resident, and then you may. Questions from the board, Steve? Um, no question, but would it be, or yes, question, yes, sure. uh, but not very good. Okay, please. Um, would it be appropriate to move no action and place this item on the next agenda? Or we could even dispose of it and just send it to TAC right now if we wanted, or if we had a different path that we wanted to take. It, or did you want to put it on the next agenda for, for <coughs> us? For, for our us? vote, and, um, but not as a warrant article, as uh, vote no action on the warrant article but then take it up on our next, um, uh, at our next meeting as an agenda item because then you know, we can hear from some more residents that you know, might have something to say on this. Um, and then I, th I don't even know if we'd have to put this to TAC. I'm comfortable not putting it to TAC. Okay. Second. So we have a motion, no action, and a second. Um, the Diane, and I know that there is at least one person here who wants to talk, so D Diane, go ahead. And, and just, to for the future conversation that we're going to have, and I'm just, again, gonna do this by memory, so don't hold me 100%. Um, my memory is this initial process involved um, two-thirds of the residents on a majority of the affected streets came in with a petition to the then Board of Selectmen saying that this is an issue. Um, can you put signs up and address it? The then police chief so I would like to hear from our current police chief, um, the town manager, but the then police chief, Chief Delgazo, and town manager Marquis basically said, 
at that time and to put up residents only that they weren't advocating for that because of the manpower involved and um, they just they just saw impediments to it happening so um, I would also like to do no action just so that we can further spread the word um, because one of the caveats or, or the milestones that the residents of these affected streets and I know you've gone out but um, one of the <coughs> similar to when we um, talk about uh, repaving private ways you get two-thirds I just want to make sure that I think this moving no action gives us two more weeks to get the word out and to allow you to get the word out as well as I really like to hear what the current I'm not saying what the previous police chief or town manager um, binds us because times may have changed but I know back then they did have some concerns about enforceability and the like so I would like to hear at our next meeting or whenever the chairman um, uh, puts this on from our current town manager and current police chief uh, it would seem that uh, making a referral to the police traffic division like we would with an <coughs> issue like this might make sense to get a quick recommendation before yeah, the next I'm meeting. I just don't want to bog down tech anymore okay. with yep. something yeah, that I agree. So let's, so, so let's send it to Officer Rateau then and, and, and his. So maybe we should vote the motion then. We, yeah, but I, before I do want to, uh, um, I know this, uh, at least one per, or I think, does anyone want to talk about this at this point? So what we're going to do is we're going to, ref, we're going to recommend but we're going to recommend no action on the town meeting vote. But we're going to continue to assess the issue. And the way we're going to do that, we're going to ask the traffic division of the police department to take a look at it. Um, so if, you, we, if I, uh, you want to follow up with the police department or if you want to weigh in right now, that would be completely appropriate. Come on up. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Mike Williams. I live on Wilson Ave. I've lived in that neighborhood my whole life. And I'm here to oppose... Um, the amendment to the, the sign for the I'm a state trooper by profession and I heard Leslie say about as far as one car goes and they all go and I'd say that's pretty accurate as far as uh, like major events break down lanes they see one car go and they all go even if it is a resident it's it's tougher to enforce and it, in comparing Mary Street to uh, the Kellen Manor Mary Street's like a runway when they take that right and the left, they just hit the gas and they try to get to Margaret Street as fast as they can. Um, so going through the Kellum Manor, they take a left, a left, and a left, and they really don't have time to get the speed up. So I'm, I'm opposing that today. Thank you. Thanks. Is there anyone else? Come on up. Oh, uh, in green, sorry. P yeah, sorry, Mr. Fiore, yeah, sorry. Peter Fiore, Precinct 2, on Mont Street. Uh, so <coughs> just help me out here. Are you? So are you, you're going to put this on your agenda in two weeks to discuss this issue, is that correct? Um, we'll, we're going to refer, I think what we've evolved to is we're going to refer it to the traffic division, which is Officer Rateau and whoever else he chooses to designate. If he comes back in two weeks, then we do it in two weeks, but if he needs more time, I would do it a little bit later. Okay, but, but it will at some point, even come if back. it doesn't go to town meeting, the issue will be on one of your, on an agenda some evening. Yes. Okay. I'll wait until then. I don't want to keep you here any okay. later than I want to be well, here. So it, I don't. I'll speak. I'll speak at a hearing. It'd be more appropriate. Okay. Uh, then at, uh, at your meeting, at your at meeting when it's on the agenda, than it would be tonight because you're going to vote no action on this warrant. Aren't yes. All right. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Though I do invite you to um, talk to the town manager and give your thoughts even before then, just to see if uh, any questions or comments you have can be resolved even before we get there. Postponed to April 6th. Corey is going to be attending uh, an acad police academy all next Okay. Week. Marie is telling me that it's likely to be April 7th. 7th? 7th. 6th is Sunday. I don't plan yes, on yeah. being here. Yeah. Uh, LC, LC Fiori, Mr. 58, welcome. 58 Mart Street, town meeting member, um, Channel 2. And I do mourn my good friend, Harry McCabe. You all know we were in 50 years together in town meeting and uh, it will be very strange not to see him there. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just want to say a couple of things about this because mm -hmm. I was stunned. I didn't, we didn't get the flyer until this morning. They might have been delivered last night. And um, I expressed to um, um, the person who was leading it that it would have been uh, a good idea to have the neighborhood talking together before we came into a political meeting where nobody else knew anything about it. So now I'm suggesting, uh, if I 
could that um, before you have your April 7th meeting, if somehow uh, the lady who's leading this uh, thing, You're yeah, right, um, should have a neighborhood meeting, and I told her that I could try to get some uh, a room at uh, Trinity Baptist Church where we could meet. And uh, I'm not saying you have to be there, but the the thing is that for people turning right, even though we say it's for residents only, that's okay. But um, it's uh, Mary Street is a you can go all the way down, but Mott Street is a one-way street. So even those of us who are residents on Mott Street, we can't go in and say Wilson Avenue. We can go in on uh, Little John Street. So I'm not totally opposed to this, but I think there's a lot of discussion that needs to take place about it. And uh, so I'd like to see a neighborhood group meeting first, and then um, we could still go on your meeting, I'm assuming, the 7th of April. Okay, yes. I'll, I'll try to work with her to, to get a space I think so I'm, I'm the neighborhood can talk because uh, she lives down way down the end of Mary Street. I live at the beginning of Mott, so there's quite a difference in it. But I myself for years have thought that we should have uh, residents be allowed to get in there, but it's making sure that it's only the residents that are doing it and not the rest of all the people who are just cutting through I would say one more thing because years ago, uh, when uh, we, when Alan McClendon was here, we found out that most of the people who travel on Lake Street in the late afternoon, they're going from, not not necessarily Belmont, but say from Watertown to Medford. None of those people live in Arlington, so they don't give a hoot about what happens to our side streets. So we have to be very clear and make sure that it's the peop people that uh, you know live in the neighborhood that have preference. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fury. Come on up. I'm Larry Taketh. I live on Margaret Street, and I've often thought it was sort of bizarre and perverse that I couldn't take the shortest route from Route 2 to my home uh, and instead was you know, forced to wait 15 or 20 minutes at times in a traffic jam and inconvenience other people who you know, might want to take my place on the street. Uh, you know, I realize that not everyone obeys the street signs and some people might ignore a sign that says residents only. Uh, those people might ignore the existing signs or any other sign as well. So uh, I'm, I'm in favor of the warrant article or whatever other mechanism you use to change that rule and those signs. Thank you. Anyone else? Any further discussion? All right, we have a motion of no action and a plan to take this up at a future meeting, most likely April 7th. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? 5-0. Thank you very much. Next up, Article 22, Community, Community Preservation Act, AKA the CPA. Welcome. Shall we introduce ourselves? Please. My name is Clarissa Rowe. I'm a um, Precinct 4 town meeting member. I'm Susan Stamps, a Precinct 3 town meeting member. Thank you for having us. Um, we're very glad that you all have looked into the Community Preservation Act. We're glad it's on the warrant. And we just want to say, uh, have a brief speech, because I believe it's quite late at night. And there will be a lot of conversation on, on town meeting call tomorrow. What we're trying to do is get it on town meeting floor. We have a proud tradition in Arlington of when we're asking money to come out of people's wallets to go to the voters. And that's um, basically what we're looking for is a vote by the town to, um, to vote CPA up or down. Um, the thing that I like about CPA, having been involved with it for almost 20 years, is it's a local, um, it's really a local issue. It's community money that is used in the community and it's decided on by local people. And it really has worked all over the state because of that. And I think the, you know, there are a lot of sort of state mandates. This one isn't, you get state money, but nothing is mandated by the state except a yearly um, reporting. And it's something that I think will do um, 
wonderful things for Arlington. As you know, um, our wonderful finance committee, um, they deal with health and safety and schools, and they do a really good job of that. This is a well-run, financially well-run town. Um, we have in the past also dealt very well with recreation. I think that we're doing a pretty good job. People like me that do recreation for a living think that we could spend a little bit more money on it, but you know, the balancing act of any municipal budget is one that um, requires that, you know, we, we use the money that we have. Um, the, s the second area that it focuses, focuses on is affordable housing, or what I like to call community housing. We have in Arlington a situation with a lot of seniors and houses that are getting older and they're, they have less money to spend. The Housing Corporation of Arlington has 1,000 people on its waiting list. They have 183 families. They want to live in Arlington, and we don't have a lot of affordable housing. If you look at the rental costs for going up to Sims or for going to Brigham's, those are not affordable rentals. <laughs> I wish them all the best luck. We're going to get lots of um, high-end people here. We like that because they pay tax taxes or their owners do. Um, but I think we need to really be thinking of our seniors, um, people with disabilities. There's a town quite close by here who actually has a house that's set aside for disabled veterans. That money came from CTA. I mean, I think that's something that we really should be looking at. I don't know that that's one of the needs that we have. Um, the other thing is historic resources. and. I think of our historic resources as a business opportunity. And I want to bring tourism to Arlington. And I want to, I want people to say, oh, I went to Arlington and Lexington and Concord. And why are those people all going west? When I think they can be. Yeah. If, you if you get closer to the mic, it'll actually help. OK. <laughs> um, and I think that we have a lot of historic resources that we haven't been, including this beautiful building which has, happens to be one of the most beautiful town meeting, uh, town hall buildings in the Commonwealth. I've seen a lot of them in my work. And this is by far the nicest one I've seen. Um, and I did go into the town clerk's office right after part of the plaster had fallen down into the office. So I think that there are things that we haven't traditionally done that we could do. Um, we're asking for the five of you to vote yes to put it on the floor of town meeting. Um, you know, we don't need to go into much more detail. We're here to answer your questions, and we know it's late, so we're here. Thank you. <coughs> God bless you. Oh, I, I did just want to make clear for the viewers that the Community Preservation Act funds projects in just four different areas, in case that wasn't made clear. Um, purchase rehabilitation of open space. Uh, uh, purchase, rehabilitation, reconstruction of historic resources, um, affordable housing, and also what, it's what playing the, fields. Playing fi yeah. well, fields comes under open space. Yeah. Yeah. Recreation. Really yeah. Oh yes, outdoor recreational what, facilities. What we're hoping to do is there was a very good presentation um, in January, and that information was very informational. We're going to try to put it up on the website so the town meeting members can look at it and anybody from the public can look at it because it answers a lot of the technical questions. I know you all have read your packets in, de in detail. I've talked to a number of you already, so I'm not gonna go into any more technical. Diane waved me down first. Um, first, I'd like to move favorable action. Um, Second. If for the very sake, just to have the discussion at town meeting, <clears throat> Second, I will say that um, I do su support the Community Preservation Act. It was one of the questions from the League of Women Voters, so I hope I'm not breaking any secret news. I should have waited it until the 20th. And, and for a whole myriad of reasons. First of all, in terms of the process, if anybody watching this doesn't really know what Community Preservation Act is, CPA, first of all, it'll go to town meeting to say, do you want to approve this as an option, as something to be put forth um, before the voters, of something that they might want to avail themselves of. So just because this goes to town meeting and or town meeting votes to adopt it, 
we haven't encumbered anybody. The next step is first to apply and be granted, you know, that we're applicable for um, CPA funds, submit that, but then also go to the voters. So this isn't doing anything to, my father already said to me, you're raising my taxes? I said, no, we're putting an option forth. Myself personally looking at this, I know um, the previous speakers have um, cited some possibilities. Um, I do want to say of the funds that you get, only 30%, 10, 10, and 10% are identified what you have to do, historic, open space. Um, I like to say supportive housing. Um, and then the remaining, remaining 70, um, given that it's approved under the guidelines of CPA, you dictate what you want to do. What would I do to offer as an option for the CPA? We discussed this earlier on the high school. Um, we don't know if it's five, 10 years out. We don't know what the funding mechanism is. Um, if we can go to the voters and say, instead of just a debt exclusion all out and out, we can say, well, some of it's a debt exclusion, but some of it is the CPA, which you'll be paying for some, but you won't be paying for 100%. We can, I'm just gonna throw numbers out, don't hold me to it. We can get 10%, so you're only paying 90 from the Community uh, Preservation Act. The other thing that I feel very strongly about as again giving the voters options is that you can go, and correct me if I'm wrong, in increments up to 3%. And I think you can do 1, 1.5, 1 2, 2.53. And I believe in the literature that was submitted to, because my husband will be saying, look at the tax bill, um, that was submitted to us just to give from my memory, correct me if I'm wrong, the first $100,000 is, it, I'm going to say, exempt. And then what it would be is a 1% would be, 1% CPA would be $57 right. per. Well, our recommendation at the moment is one of the Without a meal, meal a trip, or students dressed in one of our lovely restaurants. So I, I would rather have CPA and forego one meal a week. Right. So, and so what I'm looking at, it's just an opportunity, A, to have the discussion, and then B, if it comes out of town meeting, to have it as a, a discussion and an option for any future projects, whether it be the high school, the historic, it's on our local register, I checked with the planning department, it would apply, just the Fusco building. When we're talking Mugar, when we're talking Poets Corner, I do know the Housing Corps, um, had a discussion with Ms. Rowe today, I just wanted to check my facts. The housing, HCA Housing Corps right now, they're in uh, purchase and sale discussions with four different properties, um, up by Downing Square, Westminster, which could be you know, for Arlington, which Arlington residents, Arlington seniors, dis Arlington disabled people. Um, so uh, for all those reasons, um, I would ask that A, let's get this to town meeting floor, and B, hopefully we, as many of you, if not all, can support it when we get down there. Thank you. Um, I, could I just say Actually, a Actually, no. No, okay. Mm -hmm. Kevin. Um, well, I'm supporting this because I'm afraid of Clarissa. I just want to <laughs> be very clear about that. No, I, um, <clears throat> I'm 90% I'm, I'm there, but I absolutely favor this going before town meeting and the voters, let them decide. But I do think the two issues of upcoming overrides, debt exclusions, does seem like this is the best timing uh, mm -hmm. because of that. Um, and, you know, <clears throat> um, I, I don't like, you know, asking people to pay more money, but uh, they're going to get the right to vote on that and decide for themselves. So I support it. Joe. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for the, the presentation. You know, I go back to a few things we've heard tonight and, and at, our, um, at our last meeting, you know, at the Budget and Revenue Task Force. I'll go back to that again. We sat there, a number of us said, you know, Arlington has done, you know, everything we possibly can. Um, we've used every tool that the state has given us. Not quite. This is one significant tool that the state gives us that we have not used yet. Um, you know, in our conversation about the high school, we talked about what are the options between going it alone or trying to use the mechanisms that are available to us. It's the same thing here. We're leaving money on the table right now. The, the state this past year, I think um, uh, their, their level of what they call it matching funds, it's not one-to-one -one match, but it was at a rate of about 53%, I right. believe, this past year. The state kicks money into communities that, that adopt this. 
And that's important to realize. The other thing that's important to realize is when we talk about 1%, we talk about 1.5%. We're not talking about a 1.5% increase on your tax bill. We're talking about 1.5% right. of the amount of your tax bill. So it's actually a much smaller percentage um, uh, um, increase. So j that, that's just very, very important to, uh, to recognize um, also. Um, the town manager gave us a memo here, and he listed out a whole number of um, items that are already in our um, our five-year uh, capital plan that could potentially be funded by uh, CPA um, funds. If we go forward with this, if the voters choose to adopt it, we are potentially freeing up some capacity there for other vital projects that are coming down the, down the road. Things that the community talks about a lot that get pushed to the side again and again, these are the types of projects that'll, that the CPA can address. Some communities, for example, we, we've been starting to hear now the conversation about community center. Well, our commu our, the closest thing we have to the community center is the senior center. It's in a historic building. That the historic um, r restoration of the historic building falls under the, um, the um, CPA. And the last thing I go back to that we've heard here in the last couple of weeks is just two weeks ago, we heard all the pres uh, presentations from our CDBG applicants not all of those projects, but an awful lot of those projects were the types of things, affordable housing and some historic um, uh, preservation uh, initiatives that we could uh, address here. We always talk to our, you know, about our CDBG applicants <coughs> also trying to leverage other funds. The CPA would allow us to, if the voters were to, were to choose, would allow us to, um, um, you know, make a small sacrifice on our own and leverage that money for, for some reimbursement uh, from the state. So I'm, I'm all for it. I, even having said that, I recognize that we do have a lot of needs coming down the pike. So if we're to take a specific vote here tonight, my impulse would be to go halfway as far as, as, as the uh, state allows us. The state allows us to go up to a 3% surcharge. My impulse would be to support a, a, a question for town meeting at the one and a half percent level, with all of the exemptions that are allowed, exemptions for uh, low and moderate um, income households, exemptions for all residential, commercial, industrial property for the first hundred thousand dollars of, um, of uh, taxable value. So I, I strongly support this, and I thank you for bringing it forward. Steve, um, well, there's three votes. Um, <laughs> I, I can count. I can still count. So. <laughs> So I, um, you know, I, I, I think that the CPA is an excellent state program as well. Um, I think that it, uh, I've seen it used in many communities, um, to, and it, it really has done wonders. Um, that being said, I don't know if it's right for all communities. Um, I, and you know, we, we, we talked about the high school for a while. We, we've been talking about we're talking, we're gonna start a conversation about another override. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it makes me, it, I'm hesitant to support asking for more. And I understand that, you know, that it's not a lot to ask for a year, but when we're putting it on top of several other, um, you know, yeah. several other increases and asks, um, that, you know, I, I don't want to say they're more important, but there, there are things that we'll really need. And while, while this is, you know, it, this would be great to have, um, I, I don't know if it's the right time for, you know, right now. Um, and so I'm sorry, I, I really do love the CPA and I've gone back and forth on this, um, uh, I feel like a hundred times now but um, I'll have to come and talk to you. <laughs> I um, and I, I I am I'm open for the conversation moving forward, and we're going to have that conversation at town meeting, and uh, I'm sure it will be spirited. Thank you. Uh, I I have some thoughts. Um, if you can, I'm sure you're all shocked. So I've had to talk to a number of people over the last few weeks about this particular one thought, and my 
the fir my first reaction still holds true, which is we, whatever we do, we have to work, we have to look at the, I believe, we have to look at this, the CPA in the context of our bigger financial picture. The CPA is just one part of, of what we've, we've got. And we know, we've talked about it enough, enough times, but I'll just briefly, new high school, or high school renovation, Minuteman, operational override. And I can, and so I can, I can support the CPA if it's in that context. And I've found a way to do that, but it requires <laughs> us to take a specific set, or uh, as a board, at least as a consensus to come to, to make a couple um, adjustments, I think, to, to Mrs. Mahan's motion. So I'll, I'll, I'm gonna lay out the argument for those and see, see what people think. Uh, first of all, I just think it would be an absolute tragedy if we supported the CPA, got the CPA through, and then failed to do an operational override in whatever year it is that we actually need to do it, 17, 18, 19, or whatever it is. Because if we successfully support our historic structures and our uh, uh, do affordable housing, and yet we fail to support education and public services, and all the other things that we fund with our budget, we have failed. So that is, that is the tragedy that I very, very much want to avoid. And so when the question is, to me, it isn't just whether we think we should talk about this on town, floor, uh, town meeting floor. We're attaching a recommendation to, we're sending a recommendation to town meeting about what they think, what we think that vote should be. And I, um, and so when someone asks me, Dan, are you recommending that we should raise taxes? I'm gonna say yes, but. And, or yes, with, and here's what I suggest. If we, if you, again, coming back to the town manager's memo, mm -hmm. virtually, if we apply um, everything that we get in the CPA in the next five years to items that are already in our five-year plan, that more than takes up all of the CPA funds, which is to say, this is, mm -hmm. uh, we can, if, uh, we can fund parts of the high school. We can fund all, the, uh, all you know, all the, all the things that are, that are on that list, and we can do it through an increase in taxes, which is exactly what we're talking about the CPA. And we can do it with additional money from the state, and that's the reason to do this. Then this is the argument that pushed me over the edge: is that when we go to the over voters and we say well, we want you to do an override, every time I, I last I did this last time when I did it, and they, I said, can, "Have you done everything you can?" to save money to uh, do other sources of revenue. And I can't quite say that yes, but yet, but I can do it with the CPA. But because what we'll be getting is, you know, a few million dollars from the state, which is money that we would not otherwise ha ha uh, have gotten. So let's talk a little bit about the specifics of the recommendation that we're making. Uh, from the memo from uh, Doug, um, he talks uh, uh, to, to adopt the CPA, uh, to, uh, to my knowledge, proponents are advocating a 1.5% surcharge, which is exactly what uh, Joe said. And uh, he also talks about there are, there are surcharge exemptions, and there's at least three here that I think we should, uh, rec that we should recommend. Property owned and occupied as a domicile by a person who would qualify for low-income housing or low- and moderate-income senior housing in the city or town, so those individuals would be exempt. 100,000 of the value of each taxable parcel of residential real property, so that's essentially uh, means that would have the effect of um, removing the surcharge. Like it wouldn't remove the surcharge, but it would lower the impact of the surcharge on lower wealth or lower property owned families. And third, 100,000 of the value of each taxable parts of class or three commercial property and class four industrial property have the same effect for small businesses and that. So those <coughs> are the things that uh, that I think we should do. Now here's where I'm going to get a little bit con uh, controversial, I th or at least a little bit controversial, and that is Joe specifically. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to pick on you just a little bit about some of the things within the CDBG. Yeah. I'm asking that we recommend that we forego much of those things, and we'd really try to restrict ourselves to essentially things that we would have already paid for in our priorities. Now I'm saying we can't you do that universally, and I'm obviously and not only that this board nor town meeting would have the authority to actually enforce that, but if we did that as an intent and we did that as a part of our vote, we could pass, because these funds are then in the future disbursed by a, um, the CPA committee, is it, and so if the CPA committee is brought into existence in the town of Arlington with a vote of the selectmen, a vote of town meeting, you know, saying this is what we want you to do with that money, I suspect that that board would listen to it. So, I think, and, and wrapping up everything I said, I think that the CPA is 
the right, the, the reason to do it is because it maximizes money from the state. And the reason that I can say let's raise taxes now is because it unlocks this money from the state and because I know with absolute certainty that we are going to need the, the money before the decade is out. Ms. Uh, and, and if I wasn't clear, I apologize. Uh, my motion is exactly that, what the proponents have said, the one and a half percent, the three exemptions as you outlined, as well as, because um, I just want to be clear, I'm voting <coughs> positive action on all um, issues presented from the proponents, which also includes a, a revocation clause, which basically says the way you got in is the way you get out, <coughs> town meeting and the vote, and, but it does have the caveat, I think, with the understanding that if you've five already years. used some CPA funds, yes. Y yes, it's five years, but it also says, um, you know, if you've already committed <coughs> to something, right. you have to stay right. the course with that, but then you're out of it. So I just want to make that clear. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what my motion was in favor of action. Kevin? Help me understand how you linked CBBG to yeah. CPA. Okay, so uh, what I was saying is, uh, thank you. I, I, I didn't articulate that well. Um, well, it's okay. It's it will say one way of looking at CDBG is it's a Christmas tree. And underneath the Christmas tree, you have all these presents of things that we would not, of presents that we would not have otherwise gotten. Right. You know, things, uh, so, um, that's uh, really the best way of saying it is that like because this pot of money now it could be used for a whole bunch of other things and I'm saying you know we're gonna I'm asking us to not put additional presents under the tree insofar as we can you know I'm saying we should we've been making a prioritized list of our investments and we should continue to invest according to that priority list and ask the CPA committee to prioritize differently um, no I'm asking them to actually I'm actually asking them to strongly hew to the um, to what are their current capital planning committee and it's with the process with the town manager and the deputy town manager. All, like, so our, cap our current capital plan has five years of capital money spelled out, right? right. It include, and it will include things like the high school and, and stuff like that. Right. And, I'm, and the CPA can either read from that list or it can create its entirely own list. Like for instance, uh, Elizabeth Island in Spy Pond would have been one of those things right. that could have been done with the CPA money. And I'm saying that we should endorse the CPA and say, let, we need to resist things like, uh, not that, the, yes. I believe that was raised all with private money and some state grants. Which is exactly what the, want, uh, right. right, thank you. Um, I have just one question I'm, uh, can, Joe, do you do, I'm gonna go with yeah, Joe. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> Except my, I think my mind just went uh, Do you want me to go to, yeah. um, Oh, okay, no, I just wanted to point out that I, I think with our motion, today, we're, we're looking to just put the question of the CPA, just to clarify the process, we're looking to put the um, CPA before town meeting, if they pass it, it'll go to the voters, the voters would adopt the CPA. There would have to then be a future town meeting action, I, bl I believe it would have to be town meeting, if I read the, um, the law correctly, to create the Community Preservation Committee, which must include um, a member of the Historic Commission, a member of the Park and Recreation Commission, a member of the Housing Authority, but then there is leeway for who else is on there. So it seems to me that potentially down the road to, to try to guide yeah. that, if town meeting's taking that action, we could look at you know a member of capital planning and potentially a member of this board as well to try to, to, to align those. I think, yeah, I think we can guide it, but I think we have to be clear and honest with ourselves and honest with everybody else. That, I mean, honest is the wrong word, clear. You, you can only encumber future boards. But no, so not even future boards. Can't. We can't encumber, we can't force the CPA committee to, to do anything. Correct. Sorry, But it's, it's always a town meeting vote. I mean, that's, the, the committee can bring whatever they want, but it's the town meeting that votes. Right. I, I like your idea. And I'm sure that we're spending, we could spend 10% on affordable housing and 10% on historic resources. I'm not sure that, I haven't seen Adam's list. Mm -hmm. So I've seen some of the list, but you know, you might. What's uh, the 10% you're worried about? Well, you have to spend 10% yep. on affordable housing and yep. you have to spend 10% on um, historic. historic resources. Yep. I think you can do that. And, I think um, so. The, the, I think that that's a good thing to do in Cambridge, which is, a city, and I told her she wasn't allowed to talk about any other town or city, <laughs> and here I'm doing it. But that's what they did from the very beginning. They wanted all their money, basically, the seven, the 80 percent of it to go towards affordable housing, and that's what they've done. And that was a directive of the policymaker. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, they've done it, but they've also done wonderful historic resource um, 
work and affordable and um, open space. And just as a footnote, Cambridge has received about $50 million in state money since they adopted the well, act. How, how long, over how long, Susan? Uh, since 2001. Yes, they were one of the first adopters. Thank you. Can I, do you mind if I go to the audience? Yeah, of course you uh, Is there anyone else? Come on up. Two days in a row. <laughs> Hi, my name is Denise Long. Um, I wanted to thank you for the vote on the high school. I, too, was a student many years ago and put two kids through the high school and it's long, <coughs> long overdue. Um, I put my remarks down in writing so that I would be brief. I'm here in support of the Community Preservation Act to put it on the ballot. And I think as the board has already mentioned, you're always faced with projects that are worthy of support and that often have a price tag associated with them. And that price tag forces you to winnow the list of worthy projects down to something that will keep Arlington's fiscal house in order. But the fact to me that there are always limited dollars is the very reason to support the Community Preservation Act now. Even if the act gets funded at the lowest surcharge rate, whatever you know that ends up being, those monies, however small, generate funds that will increase protection of open space, improve stewardship of our existing historic properties, and assist in the acquisition of affordable housing. Such projects would then become ambassadors for the CPA itself paying for something that you can actually enjoy makes paying the bill smaller. It always does. For those of us that are homeowners, we know firsthand what it means to have competing fiscal priorities. Sometimes you need a new furnace, at the same time a water pipe breaks, and then you find out next month that your roof has gone. But what happens next month or the month after? Tuck in a few loose bills under your mattress here and there adds up, especially when the state is kicking in a few of those dollars. So let's establish a foundation for the Community Preservation Act, even if it just turns out to be one measly brick or two at a time, because that's something that we can all build upon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Someone else? Come on up. Welcome. Hi, my name is Sarah Burks. I'm a resident of Arlington on Mass Ave. I'm a uh, member of the Board of Trustees of the Cyrus Dallin Art Museum and I work for the City of Cambridge at the Cambridge Historical Commission. So I have firsthand experience seeing what good projects can be done with CPA money in all of those categories. Um, but as an Arlington resident, I see all around me opportunities for uh, where we could make good use of those funds in our historic buildings and open spaces, um, community housing for our seniors and those who um, can't afford to continue to live here. But I think CPA will pay for itself both through the state matches and by allowing us to take care of these resources that are such a draw to people to this community. I like to live in Arlington because of those historic parks, the, the beautiful town hall and the high school, uh, these historic buildings and because of the, the, uh, the, and the affordable housing aspect of it allows more people to benefit from all of those good things. So I would happily pay a little bit more in my tax bill to support Community Preservation Act. Thank you. Thank you. And? Hi, um, Welcome. Anne, Anne LaRoyer, um, Chair of the Open Space Committee. I'll speak with that hat on right now. <laughs> Um, and so, as you know, from a few weeks ago, I was here, and uh, we are um, submitting a proposal to the CDBG to get a planning grant, just a one-time grant for this year, to uh, update our open space plan, which is a required um, document for the state. And we know already that um, many of the recommendations and goals and objectives that will come out of that plan uh, will need money. <laughs> and so, of course, the CPA um, is a perfect um, solution to help with some of those um, goals and to help with the, the loss of staffing at DPW and all of the other needs that we know that the town has for protecting its um, parks and, and uh, recreational facilities. And so again, just to reinforce uh, the importance of open space and recreation in the town that everybody, the, the Vision 2020 survey this year addressed a number of questions about open space that we're going to use to, um, you know, feed information into our plan and they were just overwhelmed with response and people just love the open spaces in Arlington and want to protect them and have them maintained properly and so hopefully this would be one more vehicle to, to help us do that. So that's done. Thank you for your support. Thank you. See you in town meeting. Indeed. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Further discussion from the board? 
All right, so we've got um, a motion um, made by Mrs. Mahan, seconded by Mr. Greeley. <coughs> and all those in favor, please say aye. Mr. Dunn, I'm sorry. Oh, so, wait, I'm sorry. I apologize. Can I? Oops, I, I forgot my favorite question, which is, town council, do you have everything you need? I'm not I apologize. Sure. Hold on one moment. I, sorry. I, I, thank, you, Mr. thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my understanding is that the vote is as follows. The uh, board is voting to uh, support favorable action on a 1.5% surcharge with three out of the four exemptions. Uh, I believe the only exemption that um, the board is not approving is uh, for um, uh, basically larger types of businesses. Um, but that in the comment to the board's rationale, the board would like to strongly assert that this money, though it understands it cannot be earmarked for these capital projects which have already been identified, should first be used to address those most pressing needs. Um, is, that, is that the sum and substance of what the, what the vote and the comment of the board is? And the revocation language. Yes, yeah, yeah, so the revocation language is, is part of the uh, statute, and that would also, okay. I can stress yeah. that as well. I'll Let's put it in well. the comment for sure. I will, I will certainly do that. And yet Before Joe. we vote, can I just clarify, w was it intentional to, to leave out the, the last um, exemption? Or what is the last? I, see the whole? I can explain. The fourth exemption is for, we were talking about 100,000 of, pers of um, uh, residential real estate, 100,000 of commercial industrial real estate. The, uh, um, the fourth exemption was 100% of commercial industrial real estate. Obviously, we don't want to just right. ha not have any surcharge at all be on commercial industrial. Mm -hmm. So that's why that was the fourth exemption. So oh. It, it oh. appears as though to use that exemption, you have to have a split rate, which we don't. Gotcha. OK, gotcha. OK, thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone else? Uh, I, that's my understanding. Is there anyone else who wants representation to Representation of the vote and it the is. comment with yes. some of these other concerns. Okay. I'm seeing three heads at least going up and down at the moment. <laughs> if I nod really fast, can it be four? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I apologize, Chairman. Doug. I should have asked uh -huh. you earlier. You, are you, do you now I'm have everything well you need? I'm well satisfied. All right. Chairman. Let's try this again. All those in favor of uh, the motion by Mrs. Mahan, seconded by Mr. Greeley, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. We have four to one. Mr. Byrne opposed. Thank you very much. We're very grateful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next up, Article 25, Revolving Funds. Mr. Town Manager. Uh, I will, I'll simply add that the board has, uh, or I'll state that the board has before them the uh, vote as is annually prepared by the comptroller. Uh, and the last page in the board's packet uh, is a new addition this year in response to both board comments and town meeting comments, which provides a, a level of greater detail in regards to the expenditures within each account. So um, happy to answer any questions about that, um, make any adjustments before it becomes finalized before the report to town meeting, but we try to categorize expenditures so that they were, uh, you know, we add, added a level of transparency without uh, having an overwhelming level of detail. Move approval. Second. Any further discussion? There's nobody here to comment. <laughs> um, I, I know, it's so late, yeah, it's so late. I, I just, I flagged four of the items where um, the expenditures and, and receipts were, were, you know, off, or obviously the, the goal is to balance the expenditures and receipts to the extent possible, I believe, in, in these revolving Generally, funds yeah. for the most part. And I think there are four of them where that really wasn't quite the case, and I didn't know if there was anything that you wanted to flag it. The four that, were, that wasn't the case was life support, um, board of health fees, town hall rental, white goods. Just looking at those, is there anything extraordinary that, that you'd want to report? Uh, I would say for board of health and life support, that probably has to do with timing of the year mm -hmm. uh, because they're, they're larger. Okay. Uh, town hall, uh, the fact that <clears throat> they're off really is that, uh, based on the fact that we're using that town hall to pay for some deferred maintenance and larger capital projects within town hall, so those don't necessarily show up in one year, so we build a little bit of a balance and <coughs> spend them, um, or in this case, spend a little bit of a balance that we've uh, drawn up and pa uh, built up in past years. And wh I didn't, what was the fourth one you mentioned? White goods. Uh, white goods, it, well, that's not it. So what white goods is really on its, um, it's, it's moving towards its closure. Uh, <coughs> we, we don't really, 
collect very much into white goods under the new tra under the new uh, collection contract. Uh -huh. right? uh, so there's very few revenues coming in. So we're sort of spent spending down what we have, mostly on offsetting the recycling coordinator's position. So that's so that potentially in the future we'll be we'll be looking to yeah. move to strike that from the revolving funds. Okay, thank you. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. It's five zero. So special town meeting article two home rule legislation uh all alcohol licenses second do we need to fill in a blank on that one i was going to say that it's not a number <laughs> it's not a number yeah, we didn't yeah. provide a number no, it no, just increased from 15 is all it said it oh. right maybe i read was it i may have read it wrong too uh okay. What do we want? What to is do? the number that? <laughs> That's that exactly. yeah. I thought there wasn't one, and I may have misread. Right. I, I don't. I it was Doug. If I can be helpful, there, yeah. there, there was not a number necessarily uh, yeah. that there was a couple numbers talked about. Um, it may be open to the board's consideration of how many it would like to increase the license by. But my understanding from the selectman's office, Ms. Yeah. Marie, would like to five, five, and five. But you can what, more. Refresh my memory. What's the current count? Fifteen. Fifteen. It was given to Bob. I believe the concern was, as uh, reported by the office, was that the length of time this process takes <coughs> is one that could, you know, uh, be a situation where we could get our five additional licenses and turn around and want to start all over again. So it's, it's, it's a matter, obviously, for the board's consideration. The vote language will end up having to be relatively specific. I've given you a, as clear of an indication as I can of what that vote language will look like. But it's, it is the selectmen's discretion if they wanted to say that it was more than five or if they wanted to potentially leave open to town meeting how many they wanted to approve. I would, it's my recommendation that, that you have a specific number, but, but. I thought five was in there. So okay. I, I, that would have been the intent. Okay. Kevin. So do we have to have a specific number? I, you, I don't know that a specific number, well, you'll have to have a specific number when it comes to the question that's placed before the voters. But you don't necessarily have to have, I'm sorry, in the home rule legislation, but you don't necessarily have to have a, a number when you go to town meeting. It's my recommendation that you should have one right. um, because otherwise I think it'll be far too, in, I think it'll be ambiguous and it'll cause confusion. But, but what I'm asking is do we have to have a number at all? Can we just say we're empowered to give out these all alcohol licenses? Oh, no, 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 you have to have a specific We don't have, have a specific number. Um, my apologies. Okay. Um, um, I move that we recommend favorable action to go to 20. All alcohol. So, so that's five? Oh, that's five. five. Jump up we five. increased by five. I'll second. We have a motion, we have a second. Um, I will signal that I would support 10, just because I think we can make the case that we're giving them out prudently, and they're going to things that are making the town. I think when we did the, when, before I was here, when the, the first five went out, it was a big experiment, and I think we're seeing the results of that experiment. Oh. I, that's why I'm asking, do yeah. we need a number at all? I yeah. agree with you 100%. What I'm worried about is, am I right, this eventually goes to the voters. Right. Yes. Yep. So yeah. I'm afraid voters seeing go from 15 to 25, and then I think, whoa, what's okay. the, the town no, going to become? Yeah. All right. Uh, 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 but I'm, w I'm with you otherwise. I'm just worried about the perception. I'm, I'm happy to support five. Yeah. Any further discussion, seeing as no one else is here to talk about this one either? <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have a motion from Mr. Greeley. Uh, I apologize. Mr. Kira, Mr. Kira, second. second, and thank you. I lost it. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Move approval of second. all final votes and comments. I have one oh, sorry. change. No, no, it's sort of totally appropriate. We have, it's, I'm sure people will agree with me. Uh, actually, one is I'm sure, and one I'm not so sure. <laughs> uh, article 20 was 4-1. As a, uh, opposed to five zero, it's been noted. Yes, okay. Corrected. All right, and um, Article Fifty Four. I thought we would just wanted to say will report. Now maybe that isn't the vote that I we successfully took, but I think so. My my argument is we want to see how electronic town voting works, and then we want to make a recommendation. That's, that's the way I interpret the intent of 54. I'm okay with it is right now, but I did just want to float, like, I feel like we're going to be doing, again, an experiment. We're going to be using these electronic tools. And we should do it for, and then at the very end of town meeting, we should say, should we keep on doing it? And so, 
I mean, we could do that underneath the current language, but part of me just says we should just strike the current, like, to the, the appropriate body and say, we'll report. We'll report. I think that's what we, that, there was, there was d discussion yeah. about whether or not the board should be the one reporting, Yeah. but if it's the board's sentiment that it was their, your intention to I, say I, that you will report, then we yeah. can strike that. And I guess I would say one or the other. I don't like one. Like, we should either just ask them to make the recommendation, and that, or we should do it. You know, I, I guess I don't want to leave it as an or. Maybe that's my hang-up. Would the proper uh, phrasing then be voted, the town meeting does resolve to continue the use of electronic voting. Is that not specific enough? Well, we could leave that as recommend, but I'm not, so I think of us. You're saying that would achieve what you want. No, <laughs> it was, but it actually doesn't because what I want to do, I feel like when we make, when we're passing these votes, we are making a recommendation to town meeting and saying town meeting, we think you should vote X. And I'm not prepared yeah. to, to take, make that statement personally right. on Article 54. I, I believe Mr. Dunn's, uh, Chairman Dunn's uh, recitation there was an accurate recitation of what the board thought at the time this was presented, that, that the board was not prepared to make a recommendation on this other than to say they will report because of the timing of it. Yeah. And I believe that the town moderator and um, uh, the other gentleman who was with him from the electronic voting committee, committee understood that and supported that notion. I think the question that, to my recollection, was presented was whether or not the board itself or whether this committee established by the board would be the one to report on it. If it's the board that would like to report on it, though, I think the most appropriate thing, as Ms. Chairman Dunn suggests, is just to say, voted the board uh, will report at town meeting, uh, if, if that's the same. All right, so why don't we change it to, um, yeah. on make a motion to, on Article 54, will report. Second. Motion second. Yeah. Any further discussion? Thank you. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Mr. Chairman. Were you comfortable yeah. with taking the final vote on Article 21? Thank you for reminding me. Uh, <laughs> uh, I strongly suggest we um, oh. take Article 21 off. Uh, Joe and I had the distinct pleasure of being at Minuteman on Friday morning, uh, which 16 towns saw me change and turn purple. Oh. <laughs> it's green. I'll vouch for it. I what sputtered. I could, <laughs> I didn't swear, um, but that was re restraint. They, uh, the school committee tomorrow is going to be voting on a new amendment to the proposal. So we voted approval for language, okay. and they're about to change it again. And the change is changing the weighting on the um, the vote, which would reduce. Essentially, it would have the effect of reducing. So currently, we have exactly one sixteenth vote. In the language that we all voted on two weeks ago, or, or yeah, I think it was two weeks ago, uh, we would have had approximately one, one, third. one third, and under this, we would essentially have uh, one fifth. And there's a lot, frankly, I want to see what the act, the school committee actually does, and then I think we're going to talk about it again. So I respectfully ask that the board n not vote the language on Article 21, and we'll revisit it in two weeks. Thank you for reminding me, Adam. I had lost so that. So what would the proper motion be to, to now uh, put no action or postpone? Table. Move to table. table Article 21. Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah. yeah. Is there a second? Final motion. Second. 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 All right. So let's dispose of that tabling, then we'll come back to the uh, other motion. All those in favor of tabling Article 21, please say aye. 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 Uh, opposed? No. Tabled. OK, now we've got a main motion, which is to approve uh, the language for 10, 11, 12, 19, 20, as amended, 54, as amended. As amended. Mm -hmm. Any further discussion? No. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? 5-0. Thank you, everyone. Correspondence received. Second. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? None. Done. New business. Mrs. Krapelko.
Thank you very much. Doug? No new business. Adam? No new business. Heaven? Keep it going, brother. No new business. <laughs> Diane? I do have new business, but I'll try to make it really brief. See why I said brother? Exactly. No, I know it is because I'm just so proud. Um, you got to talk about the chair. I no, but it please, really is a big please, thing. Please. I'm not even kidding. We, yeah. we uh, as we, uh, I keep bothering everybody about. We went to states. States do large and small, all girl and large and small co-ed. So we went one of eight small co-ed. We went in at number eight, and when you go in in cheerleading, that gets counted as your vote, as, as part of your score, a weighted score. So if you're one, two, or three you got a leg up. If you're down at the bottom, you're kind of pretty much stuck there. So the ladies and Liam performed. They came out first, which is the worst <laughs> spot to have because you're coming out first and you're nervous. Um, did a fantastic job. Uh, yeah, seven other teams. So then they announce, okay, third, second, first. They all go to National, Canton, Gloucester, Grafton. Everyone went wild. Now, I had my team as fourth, which everyone thought I was nuts because – in order to overcome coming in eighth, you not only have to do well, you also have to carry that handicap and do even better. So everything's over, everybody's screaming, we go up and we get our scores, and head coach Kelly turns to the cheerleading team and sees that we've got fourth, to which the team starts screaming and crying to the point that other teams thought maybe the national bid fairy was giving out extra bids <laughs> and started to come over, but, but, but in even the parents, because to go from eighth, in the state to fourth, they really had to overcome. And the other thing that I'm really proud about is that the teams behind us, the di difference between first and second place is 0.75, and second and third was, I think, 1.25, and then we were fourth, and then trailing behind us, it was uh, 22.5 and 28, and I can't remember the bottom. So that's how well they did. And I know it wasn't a number one win, but I couldn't have asked for anything better and from every day to the rest of the election, if I can just feel the way I felt on Sunday, I'm a happy camper, and I'm just so proud of that team. It's ridiculous. And thank you for letting me go, on, go into detail. So, Diane, next year, do they go in at fourth? Would they go in at number four? That's a whole no, new year. A whole new year. So. We're just fourth for 2014. Congratulations to you. Congratulations. Good for you. Joe. It's been an extremely busy two weeks, but I'm not going <laughs> to bore, bore you with that. I just want to uh, just share two things. First, um, Ms. Kropelka and Mr. Chaplain and I uh, attended the police awards uh, ceremony. Um, many of our officers um, and some community members were, were honored. Um, I, I don't have the the uh, the, the um, brochure the uh, program with me, so I don't want to leave anyone out. I just do want to note um, that Officer Scott Urquhart was uh, honored as the Officer of the Year which is an honor which is bestowed um, in part by uh, votes from its fellow officers. And certainly we congratulate him and all of the other officers for their, uh, their outstanding uh, duty and, and service. Um, and the only other thing I wanted to share is I went to the, um, one of the MMA legislative uh, breakfasts. Um, I went down to, uh, to, to Weymouth. Um, an awful lot of the discussion was around uh, substance abuse issues and I shared um, with folks there, what we are doing with our m uh, medication collection box at the police station. That, that was an initiative of the um, Arlington Youth Health and Safety Coalition. Um, it had been funded on, under the Drug Free Communities Grant, but when we lost that, the police department has continued to support um, that. And it, you know, all residents should know if you have old medications that you don't know what to do with, how to dispose of, <coughs> that box is there. Um, you know, it's manned, you know, 24-7. We take a 50-pound um, drum out of there every two or three months and, and, and replace it. it it's, it's serious. Um, so I just wanted you to know that the other, other, another number of other communities came up to me and asked me about the program, how they can get that started in their own. So that was one way in which it seemed other communities were really impressed with what Arlington's doing. And I wanted to report that also I met a town manager down there I'd never met from another community. He said, Gee, I was just looking at your vir your uh, virtual your visual budget online. So um, we're we're leading in a number of ways. I just wanted to share that. That's great. No new business. Uh, one really brief one, and that is, uh, and I meant to bring this up two weeks ago, and I forgot. So the information is aged. But uh, the telephone, the double poll working group, um, since our their report, they have made the utilities have made significant progress. 
the items that weren't in the database have largely been entered in the database and uh, 27 of the polls that were there have been removed. So I actually haven't gone and, well, there's a constant flow of polls going in and out, but this was actually like a win, so to speak. Can you get um, the one out of my front yard? <laughs> uh, uh, we should make sure it's in the database, yeah, and I'm sure, not yeah, kidding. Sure, sure. Uh, so uh, I was saying that I have not gone to Verizon and talked to them, basically because we're getting what we want right now. And um, I will continue to, uh, uh, I don't, uh, honestly, I don't expect to um, report back until April again to, uh, to this group. But anyway, I just wanted that brief update. Good news. Yeah. Great. Move to adjourn. We have a motion. Second. All those in favor? Aye. We are adjourned.